Hey guys, welcome back to The Batar Project. This episode, we have Matthew Disney, who is a former um, British Marine, and now he pushes his body to the limits doing crazy challenge. My man, Matthew, how are you? Thank you for coming on. Yeah, thank you very much for, for having me. It's been, uh, it's been amazing. Uh, a little bit early, a little bit late at the same time. Time zones. <laughs> yeah, so all the listeners, we had issues with time zones and that. My phone was telling me 10 hours ahead where it was actually nine hours, but we got it sorted and now we're here. Yeah, happy days. Man, I was on your Instagram. What's with running barefoot? Yeah, that's okay. So I don't want to delve too much into that, but like I'm basically doing milestones for a big daddy final challenge in the UK next summer that um, I envision is going to be no quicker in 60 days, probably more triple figure, more, more like 100 days barefoot across the UK and hopefully be the first person to do such a thing. That's kind of all I'm happy to give away. But yeah, yeah I'm basically doing milestones to see if it's, if it's not too ridiculous and it's achievable. How are the feet? Uh, the feet are good. The feet are good. Um, believe it or not, like, like here's, here's the feet and they're like squidgy soft still. <laughs> I seen you got the stick for it the other day. Uh, yeah, that was the second puncture in a roundabout, I think. So obviously miles wise, it's about 480 miles uh, as an estimate it's since been barefoot. So I'm guessing that's something like in the realms of over 700 kilometers. Shit. Anyway, yeah, so, so you're running like, every day barefoot or? I'm trying to be barefoot as much as I can. Otherwise, I'm in like things like Viva Barefoot, so where when I'm at work and stuff, yeah. or I'm outdoors because I can't like go down to the city like barefoot. I think people would like just... <laughs> throw stones at me but um yeah i try to get out as often as i can uh, my last milestone was uh we did five thousand feet uh, excess of five thousand feet nearly six thousand uh nearly 40 miles so i think that was like something on the realms of like 60 70 kilometers no about 70 kilometers i think it is um in about 11 hours barefoot Shit. it would be slower as well with all the rocks and that yeah, so my I'm, I'm not down my speed as well compared to the week prior. So we did we've got a thing called the Yorkshire Free Peaks, which is like a small equivalent of the the free national peaks. Yeah, which is basically Wales, England, and Scotland. Scotland's got the biggest. Um, which typically we do the the Free Peak Challenge in twenty four hours. Uh, so Yorkshire Free Peaks is a small equivalent uh, loop of that, uh, but it's still a marathon in length. And I've done that the week prior. Uh, again, it's less height, only by about 500 feet. But yes, um, the pace was a lot slower then, and I managed to reduce the speed, uh, reduce the time, basically going faster, but increasing the distance up to nearly 40 miles on the on the last one. So yes, uh, my feet are fine. Got my feet are fine. A lot of lot of ice baths or. Uh, uh, yes, not as many as I would like, though. It's as quick as I can turn around freezing in the cubes, really, and basically the time to get the prep and getting in. It's not as simple as just jumping in the bath and then you get your 15 minutes submerging. I have to, like, uh, freeze the ice in a 24-hour period. Uh, if it is 24 hours or 23 hours, it's not going to be fully frozen. Yeah. Then I've also got to get it in the bath, and then I've got to refill it, then get in the bath, then I've got to get out that and get into a hot shower. So you're looking good half an hour evolution at, at the best. Mm. So every story has a beginning. So let's go back. What, where are you from? What's your upbringing like? And where I'm from is actually Australia. So yeah. Melbourne, uh, even though I lost the Aussie twang completely. <laughs> uh, um, but I, I kind of, so I travel like quite, quite a lot. So I adapt and pick up accents quite quickly. So I probably expect to pick it up again if I go back to Australia. But yeah, being now in the UK since I was seven, do you remember uh, so, much from living in Australia? Uh, I have glimpses, like a little memory uh, pockets, but no, not really. Not, not as much as obviously the 30 years I've been in the UK. Yeah. So you moved back when you were seven. What was it like in the UK? Uh, it's definitely a lot more colder, a lot more grey, <laughs> a lot more wet. Uh, and it's a lot more smaller. But we've, we've got a huge population for a sort of small island. I think we hold about 68 million people here. So it's a square foot. There's a lot of people on top of each other. Obviously not to the sense of Singapore, Hong Kong and stuff like that. But yeah, it's a busy place. Mm. How many siblings do you have? Uh, technically, I have a half-sister in Perth and never met uh, with my birth dad. 
And then uh, the ones I grew up with, I've got half brother, half sister. So I guess there's four of us, including myself. Do you have a good relationship with them? Uh, you can pick your friends, you can't pick your family sort of thing. Yeah. We're all different types of people. So, mm. What was school like for you? Were you a good kid or naughty? Uh, yeah, I kind of was just, I, I kind of hyperactive, but obviously I wasn't that uh, diagnosed that sort of person. I wouldn't yeah. ever say I was that sort of person. I just kind of was like... Uh, I was very fortunate that my my guardian slash father figure that I've spent since pretty much seven, since coming over to the UK, uh, he was the site supervisor, basic caretaker of, a, of the high school uh, that I went to. So that then meant I kind of fell into all the gels of different people. So you had like the geeks to the to the to the it lads to the just the the the, the good the good lads to so every sort of category. So I was very fortunate that I never got bullied or anything, but I got on with everyone at the same time. So yeah, high school was good. What did you do post school? Did you go straight to the Marines or uh, no. So uh you couldn't be any further from like where I end up going. Yeah. Uh, in the sense I trained so uh, I was Dino's dyslexic uh, because I had grommets in my ear, ear, which then meant there was a delay on me learning pronunciation and spelling yeah. English language. So because of that, the teachers didn't realize I had a problem. So what they would do is realize I had a strength in drawing, send me to the back of the class and let me just carry on drawing. So what that then meant is I spent a lot of my years through high school until picking it up, primary school and, uh, primary school and secondary school. Um, drawing that then meant uh, I then went on to further education, like so college, university, uh, being an artist. Um, oh, yeah. But yeah, after four years of that, I kind of like got introduced to the life of partying and having a life, and uh, kind of flunked university. And uh, two years of casual work until uh, I kind of was introduced to the Marines. Who introduced you, and what drove you to sign up? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I have no family in the military, uh, really. Like my, my guardian's brother was in the army for full service, which is like in the UK, be like 22 years. Um, but he, he had no like uh, effect on my life or like barely saw him. So it, it can kind of be on not counted. So yep. in, that, in that realms, to a degree, I can say uh, I have no family members in the military. Uh, I never grew up with it, had no connection in that sense, no friends of it. Uh, and then I basically had a civilian friend that uh, I had met through drinking, working, that we, we used to push each other on either the gym or on the sand dunes, which were amazing for running on, or things like just um, typically running or circuit training. So I remember he, he came to my apartment at the time and he said, mate, mate, I think we must have had a disc with him unless we perfectly just timed it on the adverts, put this promo uh, disc on. And he said, mate, I'm looking at joining this. Do you want to join with me? And I was like, whoa, this looks amazing. I never heard about them. And this is now probably at the age of 22. So I've somehow completely been head under the rock sort of thing on the whole military front, uh, and especially the Royal Marines. And I just was like, yeah, I'm happy with this. This I love the physical and mental challenge of it, the potential of meeting, uh, or traveling around the world, and obviously the meeting uh, companions and friends uh, yeah. like on you're going to get tight in a family. So I was like, yes, definitely up for this. So that basically then meant that um, every six weeks it worked out as an average that I would do a test, the criteria. And if you pass that, aka like a milestone, yep. you then move on to the next. And then six months down the line, half a year, uh, you would then start basic training, which uh, the Royal Marine, the British Royal Marine Commandos, they have the longest training, some say the most arduous, from Civilian Street, uh, which is 32 weeks. So I then started basic training, and he hadn't joined at all. Uh, <laughs> so I kind of laugh about that. And I've seen him so many times since that, and he's like, man, I can't believe I've never joined, blah, blah, blah. You've done so well out of it. I really have like a bit of regret, blah, blah, blah. So, um, yeah, we have a joke about it over beers and stuff whenever I bump into him. Uh, but, yeah, that's how it kind of got introduced to it. That's funny. Yeah, it's a good mate of his. Yeah, he's basically just seen me off for the rest of my life. <laughs> So what was it actually like being in the Marines? What what was the first initial training like? Because I guess you wouldn't have been used to that. Uh, well, that's the thing. So I was, like, like I said, I was an artiste, uh, mind frame for four years. Then I do uh, 
like basically uh, pub work, supermarket work, casual work for two years. Uh, it was like, I need to sort my life out here. Yeah. So it was either going to be a PTI, fitness training instructor, or it's going to be a fire service. And or then obviously the Marines came about. So I was like, well, I can get either of these two after the Marines if I want to. So uh, at this point, I had like long hair that was down to my shoulders. And like, I remember going to my friends and I was like, I'm going into Marines. Like, I'm going to prep for it. Like, I'm taking it serious. So I was shaving my head off, like down to a number two. I was like, I'm going to beat them to it. I'm not turning up at camp with a big shoulder hair, yeah. shoulder yeah. hair, uh, looking like I'm at McFly or something. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, we turned up and it was two weeks of basic, basic training. Like they break you down. So they teach you the super basics. So you have no excuse to say, I didn't know that. Or you like, if you mess up, they go, we've told you how to do this. We've already taught you. They'll beat you again. Like beast is like, uh, regards to the, the, it's like a punishment sort of thing. So whether that's normally physical, where they'll, they'll just beat you for 40 minutes, make you sweat, uh, make you hate your life. Uh, press ups or going up and down a hill or carrying people or they'll do sleep deprivation or just mess around with your time where you're doing quick change of the uniform or you've got to do a kit muster and lose your weekend or uh, night time or something like that so two weeks of that foundation week where you go down to super basics like how to iron your clothes how to make your bed uh, how to wash uh, stuff by hand in case you don't have the functions of when you're out on deployment uh, in hot weather, desert, climate, places like Afghanistan, Iraq. So you know how to clean and dry and administrate yourself. Uh, even right down to how to wash yourself. Like you, yeah. we, there's 50 blokes, imagine 50 blokes. There's generally 50, 55 people in a troop. Every two weeks, uh, people start as basic training and hopefully get all the way through to 32 weeks without back trooping or leaving. And uh, 52 blokes cramming into a shower room, which probably holds about four blokes normally to get a shower or shave or whatever. And you're watching your drill instructor, completely naked, going from head to toe, washing himself, pulling his foreskin back, showing lads how to do everything. The complete basics, you have no excuse. Um, so, yeah, that, that was two weeks. And then uh, in between that, you've got fit, fitness uh, lessons and um, some other weapon handling lessons, introduction, picking your kit up. And it just kind of builds up. And your first, it's basically split into two slash three uh, phases. You could maybe say it for first phase is your individual training. Yeah. Your individual training, your uh, doing kit muscles, how to administrate yourself in the, in the field, AKA outside, how to service your weapon, how to operate your weapon and all that good stuff. Uh, do night nows, how to orientate yourself around, how to uh, just distance, how to give a fire control order. That's phase one. You'll do a thing called Baptist Run at week 15. If you pass yep. that, basically you're doing all these tests to prove you've learned everything you've done, you then move on to phase two. Phase two is when you then do things in fire team section and troop level. So you're working together, doing your command, seeing who's got the uh, command leadership qualities and, and the likes. Uh, so you're not individual basis, you know, as a, as a group, pairs, fire team section, troop level. And then... After that, I can't remember the exact week, but you then turn up to a uh, comforter week, basically at the commando stage. And now that's where you're on the camp, you're doubling everywhere. So you're basically like jogging everywhere. Yeah. And you're going into training, doing Tarzan salt course. Uh, so you're swinging through the trees and over the cables and jumping through nets. And then you're at the bottom field, going through tunnels and over fallen fences. Um, and training up for your speed marches. Uh, speed marches is basically where you're holding 35 pounds worth of kit uh, with your weapon uh, as a group of men to get from A to B so that you're still physically fit enough to then fight the fight. Yeah. That's what speed marches is. And you'll cover like 10 minute miles. Um, and your very final fourth, which I said you potentially could have a fourth, is if you come on the stages, which is four of them. Uh, and... Then for, I can't remember exactly in the order, but basically you've got the Tarzan assault course. Uh, I think you've got to do it in like 11 and a half minutes, 35 pounds. Uh, basically all the tests are 35 pounds in your weapon. Yep. Uh, and you're starting down the zip slide as a zip wire, come off that and then that's it. You're 110 miles an hour, panting, running around this course, throwing yourself over everything, climbing for everything, going on scramble nets, going all, uh, getting wet, getting soggy, 
And I just remember at the end of it, throwing up and everything, it's just balls out, uh, just dig deep. We got that. You got the nine mile speed match, which is said before the purpose of it to get a body of men uh, fit enough that, that then you're uh, good to go and you can fight the fight. Uh, you then also got an endurance course. It's just over an hour where you spend six miles running through a wood a block, um, going through tunnels, 35 pound weapon and stuff. At the beginning, you're in a group of three till you get to sheep dip. Uh, sheep dip is obviously typically where they used to wash the sheep. They used yep. to put a sheep into the water, throw them through a tunnel, and come, uh, bring them back out. Now you're doing the same. You're getting three blokes in, one at one end, one at the other end. You get the third bloke. He gets thrown through from the uh, man number one, pulled through by num- man number two. He jumps up, swaps place, and fire them all through. Once you, you three have been through, it's then pays to be a winner. It's best effort then. You can leave as a group, go through the remaining smart tubes and the crocodile uh, pitch, hit and you're then running to get out the wood block down the concrete uh, roads back to camp to then fire uh, 10 rounds and hit the target six, six times that's endurance course as a summarize and your final one and this is the one that is the last one yep. i might mix 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 the order of the other three though but the final one's the commando st- uh, the 30 miler and that's basically going on for dartmoor which is basically like moorland uh arduous hill mountain uh, rock face baby heads marshland it's just it's grueling it has it has its own weather system basically and you're going over there in your sections your troops and your sections and after 30 miles eight hours carrying the weight you then roll over a bridge and if you're successful you get your green lid Two weeks later, you do some drill performance, and then off you go to your fighting commando units to then do the rest of your active service. What was the hardest course <sighs> of the of the four tests? Yeah. Uh, so for me, I uh, I think maybe potentially because my leg length from height and stuff, I found the easiest <laughs> the nine mile. I think it was like a, just a turn up and do sort of thing. Yeah. And I know a lot of lads do find that, but some some lads do find it hard f- for whatever reason. Again, the 30 miler, I found significantly easy. Um, the Tarzan Assault course is just a blowout. It's 11 and a half minutes or quicker of you just hang out your ass, hating life. You, you just loaned. You're, like, you're not even making any sense. You're just looking at the next thing and then going at the next thing. And then you're only breaking it down in bite size. So answer your question, that's the, the three. The yep. hardest one I found was the endurance course because – it's, I think it's 72 minutes, just over an hour, and just goes on and on. So you're bashing your knees, you're smacking your back against the tunnels, you're carrying all this weight, you're getting the sheep's dip, you're then soaking wet through, you're getting chafing on your thighs after that, especially you're going through the, the crocodile pit, and you've got you're caked in all mud, and you're going through more smarty tubes, which are like proper tight to get through. You can barely lepre crawl through. And then you're running down the concrete roads and it's just going on and on and on. Uh, and like I said, you're just weighed down by all this wetness. And I think, I think mentally that's the hardest one. Yeah. I think because it's just, it's just relentless. It's just, it's just like, when will this end? Mm. Any kids listening to this would find that fun listening to all the stuff you had to do, but I'm sure it was tough as hell. Yeah, they have a they have a term like uh, not just for the test, but uh, just training as general. Civvies pay thousands for this, lads. Like basically, like, when we're thinking this is couldn't be any more crap, mm. they're like, "Cheer up, lads! Civvies pay thousands for this." Like as if like that's supposed to be a perk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was your biggest setbacks in training for Marines? Do you have any? Uh, so there's only one really noticeable, like one in my time so i ended up doing 42 weeks like an extra 10 weeks and so if i rewind how i got in that situation um there's a there's a positive that ends up becoming like a negative and in the sense that when i come across the royal marines i was like wow these are like the the, the most arduous uh, from civilian street I, i took it really seriously and i was like right i don't feel like i'm going to be able to juggle a job as well as training for what i felt like the pedestal of Royal Marines was. So I was like, I signed on to like basically the UK's job center sort of thing where the government pays you. First time in my life. 
And every two weeks, you go into the job center and the guy would like to t- uh, ask you, look, how are things going? And you say, yeah, I've got a criteria. I've just passed this. I've got this coming up. And he was happy. He was like, happy days. There's a lot of people coming in and play the system. So he's happy that I've got a plan. So anyway, six months uh, later, I then start basic training. And what that did, positive wise, was that it then made me, put me in like, um, at, at best, I was like top two fittest out of 55 blokes. And to kind of give you a highlight of how this was going to go, I ended up going to a different troop. So again, I ended up being top two fittest out of 55 blokes. And at worst, out of both of these, uh, if I had bad sleep or just not feeling it, I was like the top four. So hypothetically, the like top two, top four of 110 blokes. <laughs> What that meant bad side, though, was that it gave me a bad mindset, like I, unintentionally. But what it had done, it bred this like negative sense about me so, uh, that I wasn't aware of really at the time, but it basically made me cocky. Uh, I didn't mean this. Give you a big uh, ego? No, no, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It just basically meant that... Um, so we have a term called beasting. So beasting yep. is where you're physically, uh, and typically normally in a physical sense, you'll you'll try and knock out the person where you go, right, that's it. You've done this. I've told you not to do it. Or you've done this wrong. Right, that's it. And you'll beast them for whatever, whatever it's five minutes, 40 minutes, typically 40 minutes of golden time, whether that's on camp or off in the field. And you'll just make them hate the life and then hopefully learn the lesson from it. You can also also affect them by sleep deprivation, by going, right, that's it. You're going to get up at such and such time, stand there above your weapon over your head or whatever you're doing, or mess them around, kit changes, going up and down to accommodation, coming down, go right now, go into uh, your number ones, going to number twos, go back into your fizz kit, just messing you about. I want to kit muscle, you lose your weekends, whatever, whatever. Yeah. So this is like a beast thing, whether it's mentally or physically, uh, typically physically. So... What that would mean is that I would get beasted, but the negative side of it was I used to thrive off to get beasted. <laughs> so I used to love it. I, so uh, I'd be put on the flank, which is a term where they like the lads that have messed up. So typically we have a thing called a kit muster every morning when we're in the field of an, on exercise, which typically could be seven days long. And this is after being like super fatigued. Like I remember not in training, but after training, like for instance, I was on a junior command course pre- pre-training. And I remember over a five-day period, like nine, two hours or something, I had like two hours sleep while also doing like great contact drills, carrying kit around and being, I was just a nightmare. So like physically challenged every day on two hours sleep for the whole week. So it's, it's, it's hard. And Anyway, so I'll be on the flank and they go, right, you four or five or whoever's on the flank, uh, you just get beasted while everyone else is enjoying making breakfast and putting all the kit away and getting yeah. ready for the day's evolutions. And uh, because I used to thrive off it, they couldn't seem, I never li- really learned from it. Uh, for instance, there's like probably two stories. No, I'll definitely go for one. So I remember having this acting sergeant and uh, I think it didn't like me anyway at the time. And I'd gone on the flank, and there was like four of us on the flank, and we were in Dartmoor, so arduous ground, its own weather system. And he went, right, lads, uh, obviously we've already been on numerous exercises prior to this. And he went, so we've already experienced being on the flank and being beasted. And he went, I'm not going to mess you around, lads. I'm going to be pays to be a winner, famous terminology in the Marines. It pays to be a winner in the sense that like, uh, there's a reward if you get first. Yeah. So he's like, right, see that tree over there? And this tree's probably, I would say, something on the realms of like, 200 meters away so uh so he's like right maybe more maybe two three hundred meters he's like right first one to that tree and back to me that's it you're done there's no more beasting for 40 minutes the other ones are just gonna have to hate the life for 40 minutes so i was like roger so i off i went sprinting all of us were weapons at hand i got to the tree span around the tree we always pay to uh, pay attention to the finer details. Like they'll say, right, when you spin around to the left of the tree, if you mess up that, you could yeah. still be the first person. If you didn't listen to that detail, that's you, you're off again. Or, uh, anyway, so I remember uh, going around the tree, seeing the lad still in a bit of a distance coming back to the tree. I was like, oh, happy days, I've got this. Flew past the lads, got back. And uh, there's a thing you learn about judging distance and like um, you can gauge depending on a person, for instance, like, uh, at a certain distance, they'll look like a blob. And as you see them yep. closer, you'll see the blob in the head. And then you'll see, get close and you'll see facial features. And I was getting close and I could see this. He was shaking. He was like raging. And he was just not impressed. 
And I got back to him, right, like, right, stand there, weapon over your head. And I was just so confused. I was like, what have I done? What? I thought that was it. I thought it was done. Turned around, put weapon over head. The lads hadn't even got to the tree yet. And I was like, oh my God. So they got to the tree, got back, and that was it. I was then obviously getting beasted for the remaining 40 <laughs> minutes. Um, and anyway, we fast then forward to 15 weeks. This is then Baptist one. This is where you get tested on uh, everything you've learned in phase one. And if you pass that, then you move on to phase two. And uh, anyway, at the end of it, they said, oh, uh, I had to go to the office and me and another lad, and they said, oh, um, uh, unfortunately, we're, we're going to put you back to week six, like 10 weeks back shit. because uh, of navigational reasons. And I was like, I called bullshit. I was like, this is bullshit because uh, it's like, I, I did all my checkpoints. There's four checkpoints in the dark, no light, all completely light discipline in the time frame, two hours uh, over this uh, terrain. Uh, would be common it is and also prior to that in the on camp done both map, map reading tests and i was one of nine people with a distinction so i just knew it was bullshit and i was like yeah. basically what they had done is tried to get me, me and this lad as far back as they could uh, and they had this offer and this offer was basically they sold to us so we we're like yeah what we're gonna do is send you back to uh, 10 weeks don't worry lads you'll just do these Call uh, like uh, catch up on the lessons on your uh, map reading for two weeks, and then you'll get fast tracked to the troop behind us. So I'll go from nine to nine troop, which I was in, to nine thirty. And at the end of that two weeks, we went to the train office, knocked on the door. There was this officer at the time, and he was leaving the Royal Marines to go to Australia actually to yeah. teach their lads with weapon handling systems. And he was like, and he was leaving the end of that day like it was friday we knocked on he was gone out of the marines the weekend and he said no lads you staying in this troop and, oh, uh, you got stitched know, up yeah completely and I, I remember ringing my parents apparently well uh, not uh, i don't remember this i've kind of deleted out my memory but apparently i rang parents and uh, apparently it's crying and um uh, at this point, my parents were like convinced I wasn't going to be able to uh, hack it at the Marines. They thought, I can't take uh, orders. And probably because I had that cockiness and everything yeah. else. And um, anyway, uh, after that phone call, they were like, oh my God, he's, he's going to stick it out. He's going to do this. Uh, and anyway, from that 10-week back trooping and that misled con uh, deal and stuff that didn't end up happening and me doing 42 weeks was a blessing to a degree because it knocked that cockiness out of me yeah so the what i thought was a good thing to go in super fit ended up becoming my own demon mm. uh but then i learned from it so yeah that that's probably the, the biggest low and only notable low really in the training and that was probably the biggest lesson you learned too from all that <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah don't don't be a dick <laughs> <laughs> what was your most memorable moment of it all mm. i think just the memorable things is like it's just everything as a package like you go through like together like some really arduous things like all 55 and then obviously i was with another 55 so 110 blokes and you're all going through your highs and lows that everything becomes memorable and like even when you leave training like they try not to go oh training dates training dates because it was so embedded in you like when you see other lads or you meet new people at units and you start spinning stories or telling stories spinning a dit as we call it um telling a story um they're like oh it's, don't don't talk about training dits don't talk about training stories because you there's so many things that uh, you're going to walk away with that you're going to remember or oh, remember that disgusting time or remember this funny time or so i can't really p pull certain pieces of highlights yeah. i think everything even the negatives is a highlight yeah so what when you finished training what was the next step for you uh yeah so i then went to four or five commandos a fighting unit there's three of them 40 four two four five uh, went there for what then turned up to two and a half years. And then I also ended my career two and a half years there. So five years out of nine, uh, did the B up to Afghanistan, went out to Afghan, came back, uh, then went to 4-2 commando. That led me to, uh, where did that lead me? I then went to Lusty and believe it or not. So we're, uh, we're basically, uh, Pamir Patan. That's our, that's our motto by sea, by land. And what that means is because we're an elite amphibious force, 
So we're elite because of our skill set, but also amphibious because we attack from the sea. So yep. we get carried on by sea, uh, go on to ridges, ridges uh, uh, and then attack by cliff or the sea and uh, beach salts. And it's funny that that's what we're supposed to do, but this modern day, we don't really spend that much time on the ships. Mm. Like we're not really amphibious uh, as such. We still train in it. We still do stuff in it. But a, a person's service time will probably spend very little as an average on a ship. And I was kind of a bit of a rare one in that sense because I spent nearly two years out of my nine on a ship. Um, and it was probably one of my highlights, really. Um, but yeah, so I did an amphibious. Uh, so I did, uh, it was on Lusty, one of the last aircraft carriers we had before we got rid of it, before we then brought the new ones in. Yep. Um, and then I went to uh, some other units and then ended up with four or five. So nine years later, left as a corporal, so like a team leader. Um, and yeah, that, that was my time in, in the Marines. What was it like going to Afghanistan? Um, we spent about, it can be up to like about a year and a half initially for the beat up for it, like all the training from trying out new kit to learning new, uh, like, everyone from your fighting team to your section to your troop to your company level uh, exercises uh, how to do room clearances do everything that's going to be tailored to that that uh, environment like even like they'll bring out the vehicles like the jackals the mastiffs and stuff that you don't use in the uk they'll bring yep. them over to the uk and you get hands on with them and uh, Obama, Obama drills with regards to metal detectors, basically military metal detectors, then detect IEDs, improvised explosive devices. You'll also get uh, like anti-blocking uh, uh, stuff where it then blocks signals so people can't set off uh, through five mobile devices or radio signals. You'll try hands-on even weapon systems hands on all these for the beat up for like a year and a half you'll then go out there and cheekily they try and get you as close to seven months as they can i think if you tip over seven months they have to give you an extra week r and r you get a, another bump in your pay so yeah they they give you your tour your tour is around about 66 and a half months long okay um and you'll have two weeks r and r in that that'll start um uh, first month uh, month in and it'll go all the way up to the last month so you've got out of six months you've got four months to get the whole company and all attachments back home and back for two weeks and yeah it's it's afghanistan's an interesting one uh were we supposed to be there weren't we supposed to be there uh, conspiracy theories and stuff like that and that's not just uk that's like yeah all the countries involved there's loads of countries estonians americans germans australians new zealand's canadians there's so many people over there so many nationalities uh, uh, and then also the locals the afghan uh, locals the afghan police uh and their army uh, try to teach them what um getting in with the locals and elderly and the the, the people that live there trying to in, uh, extract information for them get them on our side trying to teach them and to not uh, grow uh, opium poppies but to uh, grow wheat and and uh, and other fields um so it's it's a very interesting one because you're going to someone else's land they yeah. know it at the back of their hand and it's also so the history of Afghanistan is quite interesting as well because of like the Cold War where America and Russia and, and the Red Army was coming down to it like basically uh, they were just attacking Afghanistan and uh, the Afghanis couldn't protect them. So and what they did is uh, Americans then funded uh, the Afghanis with like things like uh, ULARs, um, rocket launchers, basically. And yeah. then they start being able to take down the helicopters and that's when the Russians and uh, retracted but in the whole process they let a bond at uh, the whole country and it's like the most mined country in the world it's mm. it's heavily mined with mines everywhere which now to that day the people from afghanistan and pakistan like coming across the border when using these mines still in this day and age improvise and then turn them into ieds yeah and then attacking the americans with their own weapons but like, mm. not the mines obviously the mines were from russia but like the Americans have funded them in the Cold War to fight the Russians. Yeah. Uh, well, now attacking the Americans with their own weapons. Yeah, it backfired. So, 
it's a, it's a, it's mental how things can change over the course of time. Um, yeah, and also the, the the environment itself is very hot over there. It's desert. You've got a green zone in there, vegetation like right down the middle where the water is. It's and th- and their rules of engagement are totally different as well. They're like we have the Geneva Convention and rules of engagement, and they don't have that. So yeah. Like, so they they could be like laying it an IED, a mine, whether that's pressure pad, whether it's controlled by a wire, whether it's controlled by a mobile, but if it's pressure pad, like, so whether it's, it's once something's been lifted off, like whether it's a, a football and yep. then some football and it, it lifts, uh, it, t- it takes away the connection and yep. blows it up or it's, if it's stood on uh, and it's got some weight and they, they can put that in the ground expecting it's one of us that will go across it but it could be a local like a civilian and mm. yeah it's 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 bad it's crazy it is crazy like that you're fighting a, uh, people in their own home, own country for whatever reasons and they don't have things like geneva convention yeah so what was your role was it to find ieds and that uh, we 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 were like to um, we weren't there for finding IEDs, but we would be doing that. But we were there to trying to uh, fight off the Taliban, uh, the, the the enemy, uh, trying to give back the locals the land, um, try and build schools and just hearts and minds really. But also with that comes conflict, unfortunately as well. Did you have any run-ins with the Taliban or gunfights? There's a lot. Not me personally, but I lost a best mate out there, uh, which my second challenge was kind of dedicated to yep. uh, for the 10th anniversary of the loss of him. And then I, there's a lot of people I know uh, which has been personally uh, known over my time in the service, chatted to, gone on uh, and, uh, like hiking or yomping outside of work time with them. And then obviously we've gone over there and we've lost them. Uh, or they've been uh, basically wounded for the rest of their life. What was it like losing a close mate over there? Uh, it's, 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 it's hard. It's hard. Time and service, like they say, you can grow uh, a bond with the people around you more and your family members. Hmm. Like the people left and right of you are, are looking after your life in, and likewise. And the amount of time you sleep together, you you have uh, you share laughter, banter. You you go on run ashores on a night out to uh, doing exercises to uh, to obviously working together. So the time you spend with them, you spend more, and you, your own partner, your your best friend, that's going to be your best man at the wedding wedding prior to the Marines, of course, because there's a lot of say, lads that and choose people in the service as best yeah. mates, for obvious reasons. So yeah, it it can be a really difficult. Mm. Did, how did it affect you mentally? Did you want to leave once that happened? I didn't want to leave, but it did mess my mind up. I, I was very fortunate when I lost my mate um, through contact. Uh, so they were out, and he was point man, a kid for the front man, and um, he just unfortunately got around in the back of his head when he was uh, trying to relay what's happening in front of him he's turned back uh, to tell the blokes behind him and unfortunately got around and un- uh, unfortunately we're, we're told and uh, believe that he didn't suffer any pain he, that was in straight away so that was uh, there was no suffering which is uh, which is good but um yeah i was very fortunate in the sense that i i had my r and r my uh, rest and recuperation uh, penned in for like one of the last ones and he got killed on Valentine's Day. Oh, yeah, he had a, a partner and he also had a daughter. Oh. And he's gone back for Christmas leave. So he's only just come back out for two months. And he only passed out training quite recently. So he hadn't really been in the Marines that long. And anyway, so uh, I managed to then delay my r and I flew back with him, which is quite a rare thing. Um, I flew back with him. Uh, so you've got him in one coffin and another two from a, uh, rifles, which are different regiments, not, not Marines. So there's three coffins in the inside the uh, hangar of this the plane. Um, and we flew him back to give him back to his family, really. And then ended up going to his funeral in that two-week hour and hour. Um, 
Yeah, and that's that, that's about it, really. God, his family would have been devastated. Yeah, they were. And there's a lot of lads. There's lads in his section that were devastated. And there's a lot of people that were friends with him in civilian street, and uh, and obviously his his partners, his family, his mum, dad, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, the sad, man. sad truth about joining the military is that some people don't come back. Yeah, you sign on the line to, to protect your country mm. uh, at all costs, and unfortunately, sometimes that can be your life. Yeah, it makes you feel grateful for life to not take it for granted. Yeah, yeah, it does. So, what drove you to leave the Marines? Uh, two years prior, uh, I had a mate. This is the time when I was on the ship. Uh, he's the same age as me, same rank, but he's uh, in the Navy. So we have the term Matlow uh, for a sailor. So he was a Killick, uh, which is the team leader equivalent of a corporal. Yep. Uh, I was a corporal and we're the same age, been in a relationship at the same time uh, with, his, uh, with his missus, my missus. And he come out of mine recently and he'd come out of his for both unknown reasons. And uh, he just took it really hard. And he was like, man, he's got this country. So he had a, a cousin, I think, or, uh, over in America. He's like, mate, do you want to come over here? And I, I chinned it off a couple of times and said, no, no, no. And then last minute I was like, mate, is that office still up? And he said, yeah, of course it is. So we went off to the, the Big Apple for somewhere like nine to 11 days via Amsterdam, Netherlands and Holland. And that was it. Travel bug was awoken, should we say. And uh <laughs> Every leave, so Christmas, summer, Easter, I would prioritize my leave to go uh, traveling. So that was when I then went to Australia, uh, China, so Shanghai, Beijing, went go around Jordan, Israel, uh, Morocco, Egypt, uh, around Europe, the whole Germany, whatever, whatever. And I was like, I love this. This is uh, this is what it's all about. Seeing all these different cultures, lifestyles, people, uh, and. I, I was like, I want to do more of this. And it got to the point where after two years, I was like, I want to do more. I don't want to be limited to that. And at the time, you, you'd be quite um, quite blessed in the sense that you could get like seven weeks, maybe eight weeks. So that's a lot more holiday uh, and most people in civilian street. Um, but still, it wasn't enough. And I was like, I, I feel like i not outgrown the Marines, but I feel like I've done what I've I come here to do sort of thing. You served your purpose. Happy. Yeah, basically. And at this point, I was on an eight-year point, and I was like, right. So we put 12 months notice in, and after the that year, I, I then went and completed Europe in a van. Uh, that was first of two times around Europe, and uh, haven't looked back, really. Mm. They say once you start traveling, you don't stop. Oh, it's amazing. It is amazing. Mm. So was the Marines good pay? Because how did you fund all your travel? I'm very, very uh, sensible with my money. Uh, don't get me wrong, I, I enjoy myself and when I spend, I spend. But I am also know how to stretch my pound. Uh, I'm not like crazy. Like there's some lads that will go out on a night out and they'll spend 100 sterling, like 100 British pounds like, on a night out. I'm like, how, how's that happened? Like you have pre-drinks at your place and you go out and I can spend like anywhere between 25, 35. So like a quarter of the price they're spending. Mm. And you just do that. And on everything and I, I think you can still live a life be sensible but you just have more money in your pocket at the end of it there wasn't a hole in my pocket and um, yeah the money wasn't phenomenal at all there's people so I think there's two thirds of the marines have degrees so there's the, they have you have a psychometric test going in a lot of educated lads a lot of lads leaving um, like six figure jobs and stuff or in five figure jobs uh, highly paid jobs like sixty thousand uh, pound up to one hundred twenty thousand pound, just because they want that green lid, they want to have that, live that lifestyle. Yeah. Um, and you then go in, and yeah, it's massively drops. Uh, I think when I left, I was on something like thirty three thousand, maybe uh, if I remember rightly. And I've done nine years, and I've been a corporal for just turned the fourth year, and yeah, thirty three, maybe thirty. This between 33 to 37, definitely. Uh, 1,000 uh, before tax as well, before everything else that gets deducted. So, wow. yeah, it, it's not super healthy, especially when you look at what we do. Um, but, yeah, it is what it is. You, you think you do, they would pay you more for risking your life? Yeah, but I think, that's, I think that's across the board. I think every country is the same. Yeah. And you do it for other reasons. It's not just – you don't do it for financial gain. Hmm. 
So you started traveling. Where's your favorite destination you've been to? <laughs> I get asked this question quite often, or used to anyway. And uh, I think like I can't answer it as like one place, but I can definitely uh, give you some answers. So like best national parks, America. Yep. Straight away. Uh, best natural beauty, Norway. Mm-hmm. Uh, best all round country in Europe, Germany. Uh, best city stop, Krakow in Poland. Uh, best outdoor lifestyle so far, Australia. Yeah. Uh, um, I, and and best like bizarre country, like you feel like you come like off like this planet, Iceland. And then finally, the best five day break and also the best nicest people is Jordan. Yeah, nice. What's your top travel story? Oh. Uh, there's, there's, uh, there's probably a lot. Um, I, so where we then stem, stem into these challenges, um, basically I drove through Europe first time round with uh, a Volkswagen Transport T5 converted to a motorhome. Yep. And when I got to Switzerland, I had engine problems. Uh, so I dragged it through all the way to Bulgaria thinking, yeah, as uh, more east I get, the more cheap it's going to get. And I met a guy, um, when I got to Sofia in, in uh, Bulgaria, basically the capital of, uh, Bulgaria, uh, Sofia. And there's a mountain just outside the city called Musula. And, uh, it translates to near to God, near to God. And, uh, I went up there and I met another lad and uh, we became friends and uh, I said, oh, I've got engine problems. And he, he put me in touch with his mechanic. His mechanic was having some issues. He was coming up to Christmas, I think. I was like, right, not a problem. So he helped me find another mechanic. And this guy, apparently, he was like top uh, manager of the Porsche garage and then opened his own garage. Anyways, just sold a good story. And he said, I can get you a new engine. Oh, not a problem. Put it in here. So... Uh, we put it in storage, went back to the UK because we was doing well for a TV show at the time, or what was supposed to be a TV show. Um, and then uh, I paid for two, three months worth of uh, storage. And then I was obviously in the UK and things were taking a lot longer with this process of the TV. So I was trying to communicate. And this guy didn't, the, the, the mechanic didn't speak any English at all. So I would have to go through my friend. And my friend was like, he's not answering his phone. I'd be trying to ring him, no answering his phone. And they even went down to see him and the garage just shut up and apparently gone to the Black Sea that was side of Bulgaria. Anyway, after a year and a half, I just had to wash my hands of what was quite an expensive van. It's just, that's the way life is. And, um, and then I think it was February 2019, no, 2000, February 2018, and uh, I had a random DM in Facebook, this guy in Bulgaria, and he was like, oh, when are you coming to pick your van up? I was like, what? He was like, you, 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 your van's in my car park. It's been here for all this time. And when you're going to pick it up, and I was like, mate, if I knew where my car, uh, my van was, I would have got it ages back, right? So I spent like a couple of months then trying to work out logistically what's the cheapest and best way to get it. Uh, bearing in mind, it's first engine screwed. So I was like, right, I can either bring it back on trailer or I can I can try and get it freighted or I can uh, go buy an engine over there or I can buy an engine over here. It was just a nightmare. So it then turned out, right, the best way is going to fly an engine over there and get it fitted by the Bulgarians. Uh, engine turned up from Manchester. It got bought from a place called Oldham. And uh, they said, uh, oh, your engine's knackered. Engine number two, by the way. <laughs> And I was like, oh, no. So they said, oh, we can get you an engine. That's not a problem. So they got me an engine. They got my third engine now. So the third engine, but there's a to keep the oil pressure on the, on the bottom. Apparently, yep. there's a, like a, a screw fit cap. And they, they, they basically hadn't fully screwed it up. They hadn't fully sealed it. So I've left Bulgaria after the second attempt, by the way, because the second engine I got like down the highway and broke and got pulled back. <laughs> And uh, so now we're now like about a week or two weeks into Bulgaria. And uh, so I then leave off I go and I'm about half an hour away from Budapest in Hungary uh, and the van breaks down. Uh, prior to this, I've got like warning lights, red lights about oil. And he's like, oh, check the dipstick. And I check the dipstick and the level looks fine. And he's like, oh, it's fine. You just got a bad sensor. Yeah. And I was like, are you sure? You're sure? You're sure? And I got, uh, I've got gone through this whole process for the whole days and they kept just reassuring me, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. When you get back to the UK, sort it out. And uh, yeah, it just dropped its guts on the highway. And uh, and uh, so that then meant I had to push the van again. By the way, I always, the first time when I was on the highway, it was like about one, two o'clock in the morning. I pushed this van, I would say something in the realms of 600 meters backwards on a highway. 
me on my own, window down, reverse, uh, and then down uh, down the slip, slip road. And it was just a, an absolute blowout. I think it took me th- uh, an hour, maybe two hours. And then when I'd done it in Budapest, there was a there was a service station ahead of me. So I bought some oil, came back, put it in, hoping that that was going to be fine. And yeah. it wasn't too late. It was too late, of course. Uh, and then that, that meant I had to push the van. I think it was like two kilometers and it took me so long. I, I kind of perfected it. So I managed to get a faster pace this time, <laughs> but still trying to st- uh, uh, push it while also steering it while still on the outside of the van, which is around about two and a half thousand uh, kilo van. So two and a half ton van on my own for the second time now. Uh, anyway, I had a friend in Budapest, uh, ex army lad from the UK. And he said, I've got a good contact. So, uh, but it took him three weeks to find a, a fourth engine now. Got that fitted. And basically, as a summary, in the process why, uh, I, I had changed my clutch. I changed my turbo. So as a summary, we went through two clutches, two turbos, four engines. So fourth engine stayed in. Stuck in four countries over two months with no income. That's one expensive van. Yeah, it's, it's got a lot of stories. A lot of stories, that van. And yeah, and I had to push a two and a half ton van twice for around about three to four hours. That's a good workout. Oh yeah, my calves are blown. <laughs> <laughs> Do you still have that van? Is that the one with all the Disney yeah. RM on it? That is the van. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm, I'm reluctant to get rid of it. It's, it's cost me too much. I've never added up how much that van's cost me. I just don't want to get rid of it. It's nah, it's, it, it's moved you for life now. Yeah, exactly. Well, until New Zealand. <laughs> yes. So you, with travel, what's the most adventurous food you've eaten? Uh, I'm quite adventurous. Uh, I think you sh- uh, shouldn't try. Sh- I think you should try things at least once, if not twice, yep. in your life. We're only on this planet for a small period of time. So I've tried some really bizarre things. So I've tried like things like uh, where should we start? So we'll go for. Uh, We'll go for in China's a lot of them. So I always want to try ch- uh, snakes. So I've had snakes, snake skin. I've had jellyfish. I've had pig's tail. I've had honeybees. I've had grasshopper. I've had bugworms. I've had uh, silkworms. I've had a starfish. That was weird. But but that was in Beijing. And when I was on about the seventh thing in these canopies outside in the street, and then you realize that just chip fr- uh, a deep front deep pan fryer behind him yeah. and everything just stays the same i was like yeah i'm not having this anymore <laughs> um uh what else have i done? unfortunately i tried whale uh that's in iceland that's kind of a common thing over there uh i'll never do it again for that reason but i was very curious and it's really nice as well which is a nightmare uh i've had puffin that really cute bird yeah. as well with a colorful beak yeah uh, horse uh, I've had all intestines, pretty much of pig and cow, like from testicle, penis, bull penis in America, uh, eyeballs, brain, uh, stout, ear, um, heart, lung. Uh, what else have I had? Uh, chicken cartilage. Yeah, I've, I've tried a couple of things. Yeah. I remember Justin telling me, I think it was in Iceland or Norway or something, there's this fish where they piss on it to ferment it. And he, <laughs> yeah, he tasted that. <laughs> nice yeah he said it, he said it tasted beautiful <laughs> yeah I, I, i'm still to try that one i'll, I'll definitely get it on my list <laughs> so how about, me, huh? how about yourself have you tried many things no i haven't even traveled much so i've only gone to china and bali nah we're in china uh three years ago four years ago whereabouts though um it was on like a tour thing so i went to like beijing all the tourist places yeah, yeah, yeah. The Great China Wall. And, yeah, yeah, I climbed all that. I did all that. I wouldn't go back. It's not somewhere I'd go. Yeah, it's tick in the box. Great China Wall. But like, I can definitely understand it's not a, tick, a second visit place. No, nah, it's somewhere you just go, tick the box and don't go back. Like, all the pollution and that and that. That's the thing. It's it's mad. It's mad. And the, the, like, the culture and the way they live is just bizarre. Yeah, it's crazy. So talk to me about this TV show that you were going to be on. I seen some pictures where you had the full beard and everything. <laughs> yeah, the whole rebellious being in the military nine years having to shave. So second I left, I was just growing a beard. Uh beard was down to like the bottom of my neck at least, if not more. Um and yeah. So I was in uh Switzerland when I had that engine issue engine issue and basically I had a met, made our met in Malta prior to leaving in the spring. So I've now 
left the Marines in summer and got to Switzerland probably maybe autumn or late summer. Um, and this mate that I met a quarter of the year back in spring said, oh, mate, I've got this uh, uh, this thing. Uh, I've applied to it, but I think it's got your name all over it. It's this TV show, blah, blah, blah. So I sent you an application form, filled it out, sent it off, didn't think anything of it, uh, was enjoying traveling. Two months later, I got an email saying, congratulations, you got to stage two. And I was like, what? A stage two what? And I was like, I had to then do my research and think, what the hell have I applied to here? <laughs> so obviously it was 5,000 application forms, then whittled down to 1,000 people. I was in Bulgaria and it's asking for two-minute video. And I was like, well, I'm going to leave my van here um, and expect to get a new engine. Obviously that didn't happen. And um, I went back to the UK and about 24 hours before it closed that that, that stage, I filled, filmed a two-minute uh, video. That then sent me to uh, stage three. I think then we ran down to the last 100 um, basically interview stages uh, in Manchester, Liverpool. I went to Manchester. Um, that was like a proper X-Factor interview. And then you had to do a, a photo booth interview and you had to do a pre and post video interviews, just loads of interviews, meeting people that are going to potentially be on this show, uh, this new show. Uh, and and then obviously the next day was just public voting one to find the top 50 people that got through. And uh, basically that was like six week public voting uh, where they uh, had to get people uh, to do these four clicks of vote uh, or four stages click uh, to, to vote for this yeah. person. And the top 20 people would then go to final interviews. And, um, and I did really well on that because I was in the military. I had a lot of support for the military that even to the final day and well on the final hours, I was like, I've, I'm, I've, I've led I'm, I'm like a whole percent point one or something ahead of the second person. So I was like, I'm not chasing votes anymore. I'm going to do this like Disney grand finale. I was doing these lines just randomly. They didn't really help. I just did them for the, the crack of it. And uh, this, this, the grand finale, I'll, I can send you the link after this. Yeah. And um, there's a two minute summary, but I, I did like an hour and a half one where it got viewed by about 34,000 people at the time. Um, and it's basically, I was in my, my number twos in the Marines with a big beard and I was uh, having this, and my friends turn up one at a time with a dish and a reveal an item and it would escalate and it was different body parts of an animal, of course. Yeah. And um, uh, after 10 exquisite uh, pieces of food i then was like oh i feel like dessert now uh, i feel like a lady i feel like a dessert so then i took my uh, uniform off to reveal a, a dress a flowery dress and i had a wig on and everything then and then i then went for the world's hottest chili uh, the world's hottest chilies the top four yeah starting for the caroline reaper because i thought well if i can't get through them at least i've tried the hottest yeah uh, i got through them and then one of my former army mates, he said, mate, do cinnamon challenge. And uh, so prior to this, so obviously I then finished my 15th dish on the, on the chili challenge, uh, the uh, cinnamon challenge. And oh my life, there's a video of me doing the cinnamon challenge. And it's, if I had to explain, it's like, it turns into like an inferno inside your mouth, yeah. but like cements, cements at the same time. Oh. So you can't get off the roof of your mouth. It's on your tongue. Everything's just cementing to your mouth, but it's just going raging hot. It's like someone's got a blowtorch in there. Um, yeah, so I did that. Uh, what was it, what it like the next day? Uh, it was all right. It was all right. <laughs> totally fine. Totally fine. Uh, and yeah, the next day I was, uh, I found that I was then in the top 10. Off I go to an island. And it basically turned out that every day they would alternate between a physical test and a, psych uh, a mental test. Um, and it would be a knockout. Uh, process and then at the end of the 10 days whoever's remaining would win this uh, so they were looking for the most respected the most worthy most uh, deserving person to win a black card that was loaded with an undisclosed amount where you could then go and do anything around the world wherever you want uh, for a three month period yeah uh, and you would book everything in prior and as long as they okay it uh, but you would have to do it on your own and you can't have uh, buying materialistic things. So it's all experiences. And yeah. it's basically an experiment to see if money can truly buy happiness. Mm -hmm. So if you go to this country and experience this and go to that festival or do a bungee jump there, at the end of it, do you feel like you were more content with life and if you never had that? Yeah. Uh, now, I had done, six, I'd done pretty well on the show. I unfortunately didn't win it, but... 
yeah, it was a good experience. I think the only sour taste in my mouth was that the channel didn't, uh, basically it's got shelved. Um, uh, and the only sour the taste in my mouth was the fact that it spent three and a half months, uh, three and a half years, sorry, three and a half years process from the application form to concluding that nothing was coming from it, basically. And I was like, if it was a year and a half, uh, I would be super happy about it. But uh, yeah, three and a half years of my life gone. Uh, and there are some positives, but I think when you put it on a weighing scale, it unfortunately yeah. it outweighs. Uh, but I think the thing that counts as that is that the guy that funded it, he lost millions on it, absolute millions. Yeah. So I suppose that's uh, I suppose that's slightly the sweetener to it. Obviously, it could be worse. Mm, I guess it's, it's, a, it's an experience you can look back on. Yeah, definitely, hundred uh, percent. They had a great film crew. They had the people that do like Top Gear and Grand Tour. They do some f- famous comedians and stuff. So we had like, all the works. And it was supposed to be like the Love Island sort of quality grade program, like uh, prime time TV. Or uh, they were pushing for like Netflix and stuff. But uh, unfortunately, uh, but we're a different concept. Obviously, who's worthy, dis- respected, deserving? Mm. Uh, it just got shelved. Unfortunately, uh, basically, the guy had no experience in TV. Yeah, and he's an entrepreneur from uh, the property uh, side of things, uh, building uh, buildings. Made his millions. I think his net worth was potentially supposedly around about forty million. And he obviously, as a growing up, wanted to do a TV channel to like. Um, and he just put all his money into it. Well, not even put all of his money, but put a, a fair chunk, but put his time, took his focus off his companies onto this. Yep. And him being an entrepreneur for the longer picture, I'm going to save pounds by mm. filming the whole thing rather than doing what you should do, uh, sell the idea uh, or make a pilot, sell the pilot. And then people can tweak it, be interested. Yeah, we like that, but we want to change that. Yeah. If you film the whole thing, they can't change anything. And yeah. that's basically what happened. Uh, people are like, oh, they all look like they're doing well in life or there's no uh, there's no people of any colour in it, which there was in the final 50, but the, the people of colour didn't, unfortunately, get enough votes to get in the top 20. Yeah. Uh, one ch- show we even found out about the, the voting stage and was disgraced about the whole self-advertisement for a show that hadn't even been secured by a channel and thought, no, nah, we're not interested in close the door instantly. Yeah. And I think his trying to save books in the end lost in millions. Hmm. Have you heard of the show Survivor? Yes, I have heard of Survivor. What you've said, it kind of sounds similar, being on an island with the challenges and that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But we're not in a survival sort of concept, yeah. but we're more you know, like these physical and mental challenges. And like, and then just you then go back to this mansion and okay. then you go into a, 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 a room, like a diary room, uh, one at a time, and you basically rank everyone apparently of that day. But obviously, we all knew each other prior to that, so you're going to be biased to some people. Mm. Anyway, you categorize whoever's remaining in order of how well you felt they did, how uh, they you felt they were worthy, respected, or deserving of that day. And then obviously the bottom two would go up against the table uh, of the judges, including yeah. him being one of them. And then they would have to defend their case of why they should stay on the show. No, oh, interesting. Until the and and what, was the, what was the name of the show? The Perfect World Project, or is that uh, what it was? Yeah, yeah, that was it. But yeah, it's been shelved. Wonder if we'll get aired sometime in the future. No, I think you have a lifespan on them, and once it's expired, I think you've got about a year and a half or something maximum. If it's if no one's picked it up, it's it's going to be dated. God, what a waste of money that is. A lot of money. <laughs> How did you get into all these challenges? When did that start? That's associated to that van. Uh, so the van, yeah. so obviously van came up on my radar in February. Uh, around about this time, I felt my birthday is 1st of August. So that was due and it was supposed to be my 35th birthday. And yeah. instead of being like a normal person <laughs> and going, I want to go out for a drink or a meal, or if you really love it, go on a holiday, celebrate your birthday. I was like, no, I'm going to go to a gym and just beast myself. I'm just going to physically challenge myself, see how fit I am as a 35-year-old, and then the following year, see see where I uh, power up with it. And it started off with one challenge, and then it was like another challenge, and then eventually came up with three ideas I was going to do in, in one day. Anyway, then the van comes into play, and I then expect to go pick up this van and have a 10-day casual, chilled, three days, get my engine put in, 
and seven days casually making myself uh, back from the east of Europe back to the, um, uh, Britain by Nuremberg in Germany, one, one of the last places in Germany I had to do. And yeah, that didn't work out. And then basically it went over my birthday and I was gutted. I was so upset. Like I wasn't going to be able to test myself and had this plan and everything. And I was just like, not depressed, but like just on a bad one. Like I was like, what should I do? What should I do? And I just remember, I must have been like, just prior to meeting my missus, uh, October sort of area, like a month before. And I was like, you know what? Next year, like the following year, I'm just going to have some challenges and I'm going to do them. I'm going to set up this page. And I think I set up the page like uh, end of October. And the intent was to do seven challenges, um, each one escalating, each one better in the previous, trumping it uh, to raise money for good causes and charities, really. And yeah, 2019, January the 15th was the beginning of what is Disney Island. What was the first challenge? Uh, it was my intro challenge. I tell some people, and they're like, that's a hell of a challenge for an intro. <laughs> uh, so uh, I went down to Royal Marines Reserve in Liverpool uh, to spend an hour and 40 minutes on a treadmill doing 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off, top speed, which is universal, is about 20 kilometers, level 20. Um, so I would do, yeah, level 20, 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off for an hour and 40 minutes. Wow. A hundred of them. I'm surprised you didn't die. I so I I remember training. I've done about twenty four percent of that target. I was like, yeah, I'm happy with this. And then I remember on the day, I think I was about eighty three laps in, and I was like, I, I can't wait for this end. But how long? <laughs> eighty three, eighty seven, something like that. And I was like, this is this is breaking me. This is this is disgusting. Uh, it was disgusting. And uh, there is a future challenge that I want to do similar to that. Uh, so my last challenge in the UK, I plan to do, I will reveal this one, um, not revealing the big daddy prior to that, yep. but um, but the, the last one, uh, I can't do it before because it doesn't, it will have a negative impact on my training for the big daddy. So I'm going to do it afterwards. And what I'm looking at doing, remember the geezer holds the record for the fastest marathon in two hours, one minute official marathon. And then he also broke it and did the 159 in Austria, Vienna. Uh, but obviously he had the Nikes on that got massively slated because he had carbon springs in and stuff. And he had a, a, a pace car and he had tr- uh, paces next to him, uh, everything like that. But either way, he still did a marathon 20, yeah. uh, 26.2 miles or 42.2 kilometers, I think it's, in 159. He, he, he was the first person to ever do it. And I would like to see if I can do that. So his speed, they went around to the major spots in the UK with a massive treadmill. Like this treadmill was, I reckon, it must have been at least five meters wide. And it was about, I don't know, 10 meters long with crash mats and stuff at the back, you know, like the gymnastic cubes. Yeah, they yeah. Have them once. And they would just get people and go, oh, do you want to jump on here and see how fast, see how long you can do his pace and his pace is 21.1 kilometers so it's 1.1 kilometers faster than what i was doing on um, uh, sprints and uh, obviously they were in jeans and shoes and like they were in like no one was in gym gear no one was in like warm-up everyone was just going up there and crashing straight away pretty yeah. much um and i would like to see if i can take up to that 1.1 extra and do the same pace for a marathon, which I think is like 253 laps or something like that, uh, if you do 30 seconds on 30 seconds off. I would like to see if I can retain the 30 second uh, break time. But if I can, it'll then mean hypothetically or uh, technically, it's going to take me four hours to do his two hour pace. Wow. See, I just did a marathon two weeks ago, my first one. It took me five hours and 24 minutes. (laughs) Wow, first and marathon. I, and I have, I'd like, to be honest, I didn't really train for it at all. I've, yeah, yeah. The most I've ever run was 10 kilometers. Mate, that's, and that's amazing. That is, so you've just quadrupled, over quadrupled what you would, uh, the most you've ever done. Yeah. And how do you feel about it now? Like, is it like awoken like a bug? Yeah. Like, I really love running, but it kind of feels surreal that I ran that far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you look at it on paper, you go, how did I run that, like, that? That, that distance mm, the next day yeah. i was in a world of pain my knees felt like a chronic <laughs> arthritis i was gone yeah 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 
Yeah, it's, it's really good though. It's really good, and and, and hopefully that's now going to push you onto new places. That's it's only going to be there for a positive aim. It's going to put you in a great mindset and build you up to be a better you. Mm. The best thing I love about running is my legs were killing me, but my mind was so clear. It was a weird yeah, yeah. feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like they, they, runners high, shit. they call it. Yeah, it just takes your mind off everything that's going on in your life. Mm. Like even down to like that day, things that need to be done, little jobs or uh, or your work life. And that's it. The only thing you're thinking about is what's around you and enjoying. Yeah, we did it at um, like midnight as well. So it was like oh, nice. black. Yeah, there was yeah, yeah. no one around. It was great. That's an even better experience than doing it at nighttime. Like, yeah, I suppose you kind of unfortunately jumped the gun at like because you, you've then gone from the daylight one and then you've then can still like have something to look forward to like get another experience but you've just double whammied it and gone and got that at the same time uh the night time is great it's Mm. phenomenal Mm. it becomes even more surreal yeah let's go through your challenges so your first one was the treadmill what were the other ones 100 sprints i then marked the 10th anniversary of my mate that died that we spoke about earlier uh by doing height of everest on a revolving staircase stairmaster basically in the blackpool football club uh, I did that in sub nine hours, I think. Uh, yeah, that, that's quite a cheeky one. How many kilometers uh, is that? I can't remember off the top of my head. So I think every off the top of my head is 8,810 meters high. Uh, someone's going to slate me and say it's not <laughs> right. But it's, it's around that ballpark. Um, a sub nine hours, and I can't remember what sort of steps you're looking at. I think. I can't remember if it's something like 78,000 steps or something. Again, someone's probably going to smash me for that. <laughs> it, it was obviously uh, Valentine's Day of 2019. I've not done that since. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of, uh, kind of I've deleted it off my memory, the, the yeah. Pacifics and the numbers. So that was my second one. That was a month later, pretty much. Um, then we fast forward to another month, so mid-March. Uh, I then attempt doing uh, four marathons back-to-back, 104.8 miles. Uh, 160 kilometers, I think, off the top of my head. Um, and that's going from Liverpool to Manchester and back again via a place called Warrington and Wirral. Yep. Um, now, uh, I managed to blag, convince uh, t- uh, three former Marines to join me on this stupid challenge. Uh, my missus had done all the prep and stuff, and she never slept that night prior to that. So it then turned out she was awake for like excess of 36 hours. She's got hardcore and she's dug out. She made all banana bread, flapjack, did all the boxes, drove us all down there and then drove between each of the stops. Like, so I think it's like uh, six miles, 10 kilometer uh, checkpoints, like every, every hour because we we're trying to do a 10 minute mile pace. Yeah. Uh, um, just relax. And yeah, so she'd be there in the pitch black darkness. I've only been going out with her for like, what, five months maximum. And then she's waiting for this bloke with his three mates in pitch black, in darkness, in, in a car, uh, where obviously you could get flashes or attackers or anything like that. And she's there, just good to go with her, her next supplies and reflash and re, replans. Um, you need to put a ring on her finger. Oh, mate, she's, yeah, she's, she digs out. And um, anyway, so we uh, unfortunately done all the training uh, and we took uh, done the reccees and done, did everything but then we advertised and took some lads come from London all the way, uh, Scotland should I say all the way down uh, to Liverpool so now back into England uh, so we couldn't change the date and when we did it it was day two of a three day storm uh, oh. called Storm Katrina if I remember rightly yep. uh, basically the bridges were uh, either shut down or reduced speeds uh, the roads were flooded like we had horizontal rains. Uh, I can't remember what speeds they were going up to, but no one was outside apart from like the odd dog walker or the odd other side, like mental runner. And uh, it was just us. And um, off the back of that, we had one lad pull his hip uh, 30 miles. That was supposed to be training up for an Ironman, one of the hardest ones in the UK. Um, so he was happy with the 50 miles. He was like, that's PB for me. I'm, I don't want to go beyond. Another lad pulled his leg around about 73 mile mark, I think, off the top of my head. And then it turned out he had hypothermia as well. Uh, another lad had had chafing pretty much from the 60 mile and stuck with me. But when we got to, I think, 83 to maybe 87 mile, we're now we're at uh, the last 
major city town before Liverpool and Liverpool's on the coast it's like where they built the Titanic and it's it's, it's faces island and it just gets smashed with the the winds and there's no protection you're fully getting hit by the elements and I just said to the lad and at this point we were all soaked through I was going to have to I was looking at potentially the next checkpoint getting umbrellas deploying them and putting them like horizontal to like act as like a windshield to block a little bit of protection because we were just getting hit and I just said to the lad and we're 18 hours in and I said to the lad I think mate it's going to be sensible we'll just call it a day because this is this is becoming uh, like it's not safe now mm. uh, anyway he agreed we stopped and it turned out i had early stages of hypothermia myself i think three of us had hypothermia one pulled his groin one pulled his leg one had major chafing to his ass crack it was just <laughs> mental mental um but i was happy with the outcome anyway especially going through a storm it, it kind of even though we didn't succeed with what we intended and we, we just fell short by about 20 mile um but we're less than less than a marathon in um i was i thought it was more epic of a story that we ran through a storm for 18 hours and if it was perfect weather and we completed it mm, yeah so, that's, that's having, a hell of a story too oh it's, yeah it's disgusting absolutely disgusting uh then challenge four we're then about another month later june i think and i come up with this crazy idea of then uh, prior to this i've done 21 country or oh, 20 20 countries highest mountains uh, around europe and uk um and 10 of them with a rowing machine because when i went and with my van that breaks down i went there with a rowing machine to then go and do the summits with this rowing machine to row the height and obviously i come back and i come up with this idea oh we're moving back to the uk well I want to do the three peaks, but I want to do it with a twist. And I was like, well, why don't I go that way with a rowing machine? And I thought, yeah, but I think it's a bit, for me, uh, I, want, I, didn't, I want to challenge myself even more. And I was like, I don't really want to drive to them all. So I was like, why don't I carry this 26 kilo, two and a half meter, unbalanced, awkward as heck, concept two rowing machine from Snowden and Wales up to the summit via Crib Gok, which is known as the hardest ridge or one of the hardest ridges in the UK. Uh, a lot of people die off it each year. Uh, Row the height at the top, come down, head towards England, leave Wales, go into England, go into the Lake District, do the same with Scarfell Pike, come off that, head towards Scotland, do the same Ben Nevis, which is the biggest one. Um, and then at the end of that, come down, go 13 miles northeast and head to Commander Memorial, which is obviously has a lot of relationship to my time in the service. And that took me 13 days covering 434 miles, 700 kilometers with this 26 kilo rowing machine to row the peaks at the top and distance. Wow. Uh, in every element, by the way, like I got to Scotland, Scotland's known for raining and I got absolutely hit by a uh, heat wave i was just melting i was absolutely melting in scotland i couldn't believe it there was a thunder as well later that day uh, or a couple of days down the line i was near fort william near the ben nevis and there's thunderbolts coming down and i was there with a two and a half meter metal lightning con- construct conductor basically uh i was getting hit by hail in some other places as you got uh, whales known for the valleys so even though i'd just done snowden i then ended up doing more uh, altitude climbing distance by going over these rolling hills to get out of Wales. Um, uh, I was remember being in Scarfell in England and just getting pinned down. So I'm like 14 stone, got a lot of, lot of leg strength, even though I've got pipe cleaners, pipe cleaner for legs, really thin legs. I've got a lot of strength behind them. And it basically pushed me with this rowing machine down onto the rocks and into like a pistol motion and I couldn't push myself off. The winds were just horrendous. Mm. Uh, and Ben Nevis was just disgusting. I was getting thrown around with the tail of the rower, uh, soaked through. Um, we ended up doing a river crossing, the four of us all linked on with what looked like a white water raft river because there's not much rainfall coming from the mountain that the water just had just gone rapid. Uh, and then at the back of that, I ended up running 2K with like basically fell running with this running with a 26 kilo rowing machine on the back to get off the mountain at the end of it. It was just a mental 13 days, a uh, mental 13 days. It was phenomenal. We've got really good press coverage and I ended up picking up this name of like becoming the rowing carrying machine man, which mm. uh, we said earlier before the show, there's about seven people, I think, that around uh, America, Europe and UK that ended up doing similar things with a rowing machine off the back of my 
stupid stunt. <laughs> when I was doing research, I seen uh, you caught some slack from the media because you left your rowing machine. That's the next one. Yes. Mont Blanc. Uh, I don't really want to go into too much, but basically I then thought, well, why don't I go and uh, what's the next thing that can trump this? How can it be like the three national peaks? And I was like, why don't I do Western Europe's highest mountain, Mont Blanc, which is in France and uh, crosses over into Italy. And uh, off, I, off I go. And um, it's fine. It was it, it, So we, we met with the uh, mountain police, we had a meeting with them. I showed, I told them about all my previous experience, done 20 countries, highest mountains, I've been in the military. I've got uh, done all this reassessment. I'm going there with my team. Here's all my kit. Like, da, 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 da. They let me go up the mountain. I then come across the white brigade, this, again, police official. He then rang them to confirm I had a meeting. He then let me go up. So then we've gone through two channels. Uh, and then get up to the first hut. Again, they let me crack on. Second hut, the final one, the main one that looks like the the, the Death Star from Star Wars hanging off a cliff. Um, they then let me uh, crack on, and they said uh, their weather report uh, that the weather is going to come in like around about three, four o'clock in the afternoon. Now you got to start really early; it's ridiculous. Mm. So we're off in darkness. All you can see is like head torches off in the distance. I left everyone because what we were doing is we were always there. Uh, the safety of my team was always paramount, but even more so was the safety of other people because it wasn't their choice. I was on the mountain with a rowing machine. And so we do one of three things, which is said in my statements. And uh, we're either, we're either come to a stop, put the rowing machine down, let them go past, or then uh, we'll take a different route. Or sometimes uh, it did happen. Some people, were, they would come to a stop and they say, no, no, you come. So they allow us to go past. Um, and another thing we used to do is we let everyone set off before us so we would be at the tail end. Mm. And on this final day, we pushed up and we got to, we went past the emergency hut. We're now 392 meters shy of the summit. We're about to go onto the ridge before you then wrap around one of these, like, the summit, mm. uh, the, the base of the summit, and then you come onto the top. And uh, it was just a complete whiteout. Like the visibility had dropped down to like barely seeing my hand in front of my face, uh, arms reach, and uh, maybe fifty meters at the most. And I just said to my, my team, I said, "It's it's not. It's now increased danger. There's like the risk elements in this." Uh, I said, "It's it's. I'm going to call, uh, make the executive decision, and bring it back down, pour it into this emergency shelter, park it. Uh, basically, intentions to bring it back and." Um, and this uh, this shelter is massive. Like I, I, it's hard to explain the size because obviously your out, your accommodations are massive compared to the UK. But yeah. I'll probably say in meters we're looking at. So it's a whole floor of a, a, a house in the UK. So we're probably looking at what's a normal house size. We're probably looking at ten meters by twenty meters easily, if not more. Probably more now. Yeah. And uh, it's huge. It's got its own sleeping area in one side. It's got tables. It's got. It's, it's, I've never seen a shelter like it. To be honest, you even penetrate it from a staircase from underneath, and you come mm. on through a trap door. And uh, anyway, I parked it uh, in a tablet, uh, underneath the table. Luckily, took some pictures, which then uh, the Telegraph Times and the um, BBC was basically stood up for me. Uh, even though their headlines were a bit like obviously catching, like the yeah. way the journalists write. Um, anyway, so we then parked it. I then went, right, should we uh, tr attempt to do the summit now? We've taken a, a huge risk element out of it. It's like, yeah, let's let's try it. So off we went, summited uh, Mont Blanc. So that was my 21st country now, the highest mountain, and the highest. Uh, prior to that was Mount Etna, which I did with the row with as well, the most active volcano in the world yeah. in Sicily. I uh, came back down. The mate had a flight the next day, so I had to get him back down the mountain. So got him back down the mountain. We did a live Facebook live the next day around about 10 o'clock that their time. So like it's now uh, an hour ahead of Britain. So they're about nine o'clock in the morning. And we did this 40 minute Facebook live telling about what the situation, explaining what had happened, telling them that as soon as the weather window becomes safe, I'm going to go and retrieve the rower, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that evening, press started popping up a little bit. The next day, it just went into meltdown. Like, uh, I had the Germany ringing me, I had France ringing me, I had the UK ringing me, people from Australia, Africa, and Aust uh, America uh, that I got friends over there were like, mate, you're in the news over here. I was on like Apple News, Google News, um, uh, CNN, Sky, 
BBC, like everything. Uh, I had TF1, which is the most viewed news channel in France, coming out to Montpellier, which is now away from Chemini, where the, where the mountain is, uh, to do an interview with me. It was just absolutely insane. They, they were com- they basically they, there was a, may- a mayor of Centre Vase, one of the regions uh, that's it's not you've got Chemini is the main one, but to yeah. go up the main route, you go from Centre Vase. And this mayor, he's been in his position uh, for six years trying to make stricter rules on the mountain, and uh, he's been failing. And he basically come across what had happened with me. He already knew uh, I was going up the mountain. Uh, he already been informed, not by myself. I uh, knew about obviously me having the meeting with the the PGHM, the mountain place, and and all the channels and everything had gone up there. And the reason I was going up there, the reason I was going up there was to raise money for people on the brink of suicide and severe depression from PTSD yep. uh, for serving in veterans uh, in the military in the UK. And um, anyway, for safety reasons, for the other people in the mountain, I, I decided to make the decision to stop. And um, anyway, so he just completely ignored the reasons and the motives and stuff like that and used his political agenda, uh, sent a helicopter up there, his choice, not mine. I already discussed that uh, and declared that I was going to go up there to retrieve it. Uh, I was then forced, not allowed to go back up the mountain to retrieve it. Uh, they all backpedaled quickly, that uh, uh, saying that I got up there. And yeah, I just got smashed by so much hatred, like mainly French people. Uh, a lot of people just uh, saying, oh, you have no respect for mountains, even though I love nature. I prefer being on a mountain compared to a city any day of the week. Yeah. Um, saying you're litting the mountain, I'm like, like, just going up that mountain, not any other cases, like many countless other cases, but the amount of litter I see people just drop, even feces on, on a path. And they're not even gone off the path. They've just emptied the pants on the path in front of you and you just really? see that I haven't gone off it. So like just to see the amount of rubbish and stuff like that and then saying I'm littering a mountain with what is like a 1,100 euro machine, um, just under a thousand pounds sterling um, as if I was never going to go back to get it. Um, it was just mental and completely ignored why I was up there and he just used it for his political agenda and I can understand why he has. He's been given a gold carrot it's like this is an yeah. amazing opportunity and the president of, uh, or whatever prime minister of um of france or kind of, uh, macron he's then come out and blah blah, blah and now they've changed the rules that you can only go up there mountaineering um which is a fair one because there are some stories there's some mental stories of people from the gone up there and have a jacuzzi and a jacuzzi pool party up there there's uh, two swedish people they flew a plane to the lower summit then walked up there came back down there's no rule and uh, law they broke apart from this like 39 euro one which is like i don't know 25 british pounds it's nothing uh, so now there's like a five figure fine flying up there uh some guy that day he was going up there with his dog Mm. And I never even saw the dog. Uh, I saw the dog at one of the huts, but I never saw the guy. Uh, anyway, uh, at the second hut, they said, you can't take that dog up. And he said, no, no, don't worry. I'm going to leave him here. And then obviously in, in the darkness, he's taking the dog up and there's pictures of this dog with blood on his paws and stuff. Uh, there's stories of like some famous like American show or something where this guy's come over there with his two kids, mega young kids, belly walk. And there's a thing called like the alleyway. It's yep. just like the alleyway. It's only like less than 100 meters across, but it's this uh, ridge, no, this um, re entrant where all these boulders, when them in the day, daytime, the sun comes out, melts the ice and uh, snow, loosens off the rock at the top, and it comes down at velocity speeds. And if you get hit by them, that's it, end, end of the days. And he was going across and they were in the daytime. That's why he's supposed to do it in darkness when it's colder temperatures, when things aren't melting. Yeah. And um, yeah, he's gone across with his kids. And anyway, luckily no one got hit. But again, he got smashed and slated because he was there with a film crew. Uh, and then in recent times after I was there, there was a guy with his, uh, from again, I think Germany, with his kid that uh, he had to carry, that, that young, not even a toddler. And again, they turned him around because it was a snow blizzard and he was trying to get all the way to summit with his kid. So there is a lot of people and not experienced that are ridiculous. Go and do these lavish things. Uh, but I didn't, I had that experience. I had gone through all the procedures, gone through all the channels. Mm. I, I, I'd done 
and, and the reason I was doing it, and then also the reason I stopped. So it was just a nightmare. And uh, anyway, all that hate I had from DMs, from Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, it was just an absolute meltdown. And um, I had a friend, uh, she asked me on one of my lives, that Rhea Sylvia, the next one, she said, what is the hardest challenge you've done so far? So this is now Rhea Sylvia, is obviously the beginning of this year. Yeah. Um, and I said, if I had to be honest, the four months after Mont Blanc has been the hardest Thing, the post of the if uh, I know a lot of people that and, and this is not a boasting this of me but I know a lot of people that wouldn't have been able to cope mentally yeah potentially would have done a negative thing to themselves off the back of how much hate was coming through mm. uh, so many channels towards me uh, it was just an, it was a nightmare uh, but if we had to look at a silver lining on it uh, I've took a step back and now I put that into equation when it comes up to my new challenges where if something went wrong, how can I minimize the amount I can piss someone off? Yep. <laughs> piss people off. Now, did you get the roller back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got the roller back. I, uh, that was a whole day evolution. I drove from Preston where I live now to Liverpool, flew to uh, Switzerland, Geneva, had a Royal Marine that lives over there. He brought it back up because they eventually... Uh, they released it. They were holding it for ransom while it uh, basically I was getting done for um, uh, leaving uh, objects and unauthorized and property, which I couldn't argue with. So I was like, fair one, okay. And the second one they were doing me for was endangering other people's lives. And I was like, that's bullshit because I've done so many yeah. things. And anyway, so, uh, and they were threatening the NBC with this eight, 1800 euro bill for the helicopter, even though it was his choice to send it up there. <laughs> uh, and the embassy was like, fuck off. Basically, <laughs> um, and everyone else was like, fuck off. Uh, but um, I'm not going to explain how it ends again clu- concluded in that sense. It's not really my place to say that. But basically, they were holding that uh, rower's ransom because they wanted me to come back, even though I had tried to make several attempts, two statements, one in French, uh, answered all the questions. I said I couldn't answer anything better or more from a being in person. You told me to disappear until the dust settles. It's commandant. Uh, from that place and said go away wait for the to the cell I go on away and then he wanted me to come back and I was like you've told me to go away <laughs> and I had tried to arrange met many times to meet up before I left France but he's just his replying replying spon- response time was just too bad and by the time I was in the UK I was like I'm back in the UK now I'm not coming back to France um, that anyway so I yeah gone pick it up for, from a mate uh, after they released it, and flew back to Liverpool and back to, uh, drove back to Preston all in one day. It was it was a it was a busy day. That's that's a crazy experience, and all that just for a rowing machine. Yeah, it was insane. It was insane that what what is less than a thousand British pounds had caused one thousand eight hundred pounds uh, euros worth plus VAT they were trying to charge. Um, it was just a nightmare, and all the international news. Uh, some people say um, any publicity is uh, good publicity, even bad. But still, it was just it was just um, it's something I hadn't really took into the equation. It hit me hard, unfortunately. Yeah, especially like some people can be very cruel on social media. Oh, the keyboard warriors were going crazy. Yeah, exactly. They wouldn't say it to you in person, that's for sure. Yeah, that's the funny thing, isn't it? Like you say that in person, fair one. But like, yeah. And you can pretty much guarantee 99.8% wouldn't, mm. wouldn't ever even dare say it in person. Yeah. So after that experience, what was your next challenge? How long after? I sat on my hands. I basically got advised to sit on my hands. So my page wasn't active at all for eight to four months. Yep. Uh, um, I think I threw like two posts. They were like marking the Royal Marines birthday and, and then something else. And eventually I, we then obviously had a thing called COVID, COVID-19, the coronavirus. <laughs> Um, and yeah, we all went to lockdown. Also, a lot of nations, a lot of countries did. Uh, we were suffering in the UK from a uh, shortage of PPE, uh, personal protection equipment. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna ra- I'm gonna do a challenge here and raise money. And obviously, I was locked down into our property. Apart from obviously, you're allowed to do food shops or help out or whatever. Uh, so I I then I can't remember what bloody month it was, middle March or something. I then came up with the idea, why don't I make uh, a one meter, five step uh, each side, a uh, mini mountain in my front garden and uh, climb the height of what is the highest peak in the solar system, Rhea Silvia. 
uh, which equates to, so people can picture, kind of picture the height of it. It's nearly three Everest's in height over, uh, it took me seven days. I could have done it in five and a half, but it just meant it ended at a bad time and it just made more sense for raising money to end it in seven. Yeah. And yeah, there I we go, it. in mountain gear until the final day. Yeah, I love that you finished it in the dress. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as a, as a surprise and to bring in people's spirits up because it was such a negative headspace time, really. And people were unfortunately were losing each, uh, people to this coronavirus. And there's a lot of conspiracy theories and blah blah blah, whatever people make of it. But at the time, I thought, why don't we try and bring a bit of humor to it? So yeah, I did my final uh, day uh, to the same height of Europe's, uh, sorry, UK's highest mountain, also Scotland's highest mountain, uh, Ben Nevis, which I took the road up earlier in the year uh, prior. And um, I did it all in a dress. Nice. And my eyes, of course. Is the mountain still in your yard? No, no, no. It, it's, sorry, it's gone. It took me three days to prepare that mountain. <laughs> I, remember, I remember it took me a whole day to move however much tonnage it was first, then uh, a day to build it, and then I measured it, and I think I was eight centimetres short, like 80 oh. mils short in height. I was like, oh. So I had to strip down three quarters of its layers back down to like this base layer near enough, and then rebuild it to get it that one metre height officially. And then, uh, so that was like... F- three days and then I spent two days doing the signs uh, for the NHS and National Health Service for the UK and a lockdown uh, sign, the government one. And uh, yeah, uh, after five days, that was me good to go for seven days going up and down the staircase basically in my front garden. Nice. How much money did you end up raising? I actually did really, really well. I was blown away actually. So uh, I guess a lot of it's because it's very uh, key for people at that time but at the same time I, I kind of grew a following and a lot of people shared it and I, I grew people that so all my previous challenge was raising money for um, charities and good causes for the militaries yep. uh, so Royal Marines was uh, basically it's a split pot 50-50 one's Royal Marine charity so close to home and the other one was Rocks Recovery which is basically the whole of the MOD the whole yep. of the Ministry of Defence for the UK uh, for people who suffer from PTSD uh so that was my five challenges remember i was said i was gonna do seven but obviously a month went with pete tong should we say yeah so uh, seven turned into five and i sat my hand for the rest of the year um but then obviously this year i did ria sylvia and it was crazy in the sense i actually raised 400 roughly 400 sterling more in one challenge in seven days and i raised in five challenges for the whole of year uh prior so I raised in sterling British pounds. I raised around about five thousand one hundred and something in the first year, and I raised around about five, uh, sorry, fifteen thousand one hundred and something, and then this year I raised fifteen thousand four hundred and something. Wow, that, that's, like, that's a great effort. Pounds. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. I was, I was so so taken back, and I was uh, really happy with that. Mm. So, what's been your favourite challenge? I think the rowing machine up the country, the, uh, the three peaks, just to, yep. like having that engagement with people. Because obviously, I saw I met all my neighbours here yeah. <laughs> climbing, climbing a one meter uh, mountain, but uh, and it's been great for that. Like people and uh, like know me and talk to me. And uh, prior to that, because my, my missus only just bought this and should I build it, flip it, and move, uh, get on with it? But um, we hadn't really known the locals and the neighbours, and now obviously because of me and a dress and a mountain. Uh, we well, that's uh, that's not the case, but uh, yeah, I definitely say the Roman ship of the country. Yeah, how do you train or prepare for these challenges? Uh, the, the preparing you right. So I so if I come over a challenge, I'm like right, what do I need to do? And I'll just focus and switch. Like so, uh, the four marathons back to back. That just means I'm now going to be wrecking whether that means uh getting a bike and try and wreck the route make sure there's no obstacles no no surprises or try and run that building up the the, the distance in that that's kind of that's how it is so you just you, you switch you you focus from like let's say i'm at the gym pumping iron throwing weights around tidying the gym up um to then going right that's now going to minute be instead of 90 percent my effort on that i'm now going to keep Dipping my toe in there, 10%, but I'm now focusing on running. Or yeah. if I'm now going to be going up and down the staircase, I'm going to be, uh, no, uh, like the Everest on the rubber staircase, obviously I'm going to be on staircase master mm-hmm. prior to that. Um, 
the the funny thing is the rowing machine up the country i never did any training for that and again the rear sylvia in the front garden never do any training for that because of the background of the marines like so we carry like pretty much 110 pound bergens like yeah. a, a day sex, whatever you want to call it up and down arduous ground like some lads carrying even more like motor barrels uh point fives the the tripods uh, like a amount of signal a signal kit in there like just can just get heavy and we just carry heavy stuff for a long distance so i didn't train for that actually to be honest i knew i was cap- going to be capable of it and just any problem i come across i'll just tackle it when it head on sort of thing um but yeah the the, the challenge i'm doing at the moment i'm now training up for that mm. so i have to change my my thing for the calls in time yeah what's the diet like uh right so even if we don't talk about um training if we just talk about base level maintenance um so i'm 193 centimeters so just shy of six four six three and three quarters in height uh i've got i don't know uh uh, not an athletic body i don't really want to label myself that but but let's say slim slash athletic um body a figure frame and uh because of that um i would and i'm around about 14 stone uh so i think that's 94 kilo 200 pounds enough um my base level my maintenance not doing any exercise no training i'm at around about 3400 calories to 3800 i'm nearly tipping like basically three and a half to four thousand calories um, that's my base level and then when i'm doing these challenges like when i did the calendar club challenge i was breaking six thousand calories in a day um in fact i just run a, a barefoot for nearly 40 miles covering 5600 feet in about just shy of 11 hours barefoot and again i was nearly 10,000 calories on that so diet wise it's just consume just nutrient dense food like i don't really have supplements i i do i do own protein it goes in my overnight oats or porridge but realistically i'm not like strict on it i don't wake up at like one or two three o'clock in the morning and have another shake or anything i don't like have three scoops a day i just have it in my protein in the morning because i have enough protein like my chickens and my fish or whatever yeah. just have a balanced diet greens veg stuff like that um maybe some vitamin tablets if if i can remember to take them like just absorbed into my liquid um i don't do supplements i don't have a stick rich strict regime i'm not on like chicken and rice or chicken and peas or whatever they, they yeah. have i don't have pre-packed meals for the whole week it's just i just eat healthy i enjoy healthy food i eat yep. homegrown stuff mm. uh, from the supermarket yeah do you lose much weight when you do these challenges uh yeah i think you do strip down you do yeah. strip down i remember like when i used to cycle not even training for stuff like cycling just strips fat off you mm. like i don't really see a fat guy cycling and exactly. if you do you don't cycle much <laughs> i was on the instagram and seeing that you got your kid off and you're climbing a summit was that actually you yeah i've been naked on a lot of summits or hanging off waterfalls or hanging off cliffs with just my hand and yeah, there's kind of a lot of don't let death got don't let get don't let death get in the way of a good thought. Yeah. Um as long as you risk assess and you know what you're capable of. I would never advise anyone to do what I've done in the sense of Iceland. I hung off a, a bridge over the top of a rapid waterfall uh, river, uh, a fossen as they call it. Or when I was in Norway, I there was a they have the pulpit which is it's featured in the end of uh, the new Mission Impossible. Okay. They had the fight with Tom Cruise and Henry Cavill. Uh, it's funny actually because once you've been there, you know that them two fight scenes or that fight scenes two different locations that are pasted together. And they land on this rock that's 25 meters by 25 meters. And I think it's something like 670 meters drop that looks over a fjord. It's, it's an overhang cliff, basically. It's beautiful. It's, it's one of the three tourist attractions in uh, in Norway. And I was told that there's this uh, rope climbing picket that's stuck in the corner on one, on one of the one of the ends. So I went there with that in my head. I was going. I knew what I was going to do. I went over there, and obviously I'm not stupid. I gave it a good wiggle. I uh, knew that I could take my weight and then just literally grabbed hold of it and swung my body off the cliff. 
and uh, I had this uh, African guy with me that's traveling for two days. Uh, I knew, met him through Count Surfer, I think it was. And he was just like, mate, you're mental. And he, he took, <laughs> took two pictures. He took me, he took a close-up picture. I'm like, right, right, can you go over there to this other mountain and take another picture so people can get perspective what the hell I'm doing? Yeah. So he goes, and then do it the second time around. So I've done it twice now. And then uh, I got myself back up and I had this, uh, I, can, I can only presume a, a guy from somewhere like India or something. He's come over to me and go, you're mental and like but he's wrote crazy or mental or something with his finger in my forehead as you've been saying in his head uh, <laughs> off um but yeah I, I just think life's life's too short not to not 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 take risks you can be reckless of course you can you've got a risk assess you've got to know what you're capable of but you've got to also enjoy life you've uh, it, and enjoy life as much as you can, whether that means in trying and being adventurous of uh, bizarre foods or traveling, experiencing the life cultures and seeing new people and seeing how people live uh, to just getting that adrenaline rush in, in a safe manner, of course. Yeah. Well, being naked in the snow would have been very cold, especially down there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it, it can be. I don't. Uh, I think there's one picture that you're potentially on about. I'm, cl- I'm drinking homemade plum brandy on uh, Reese, which is Poland's highest mountain. I'm sat on the. Uh, I'm stood on the top, completely naked, just drinking a bottle straight uh, out the bottle. Uh, and there's two pictures. There's one with me and just the backdrop and on top of the summit with nobody in the picture. And then I had this uh, Polish guy. No, uh, hung. Where was he from? Hungarian. So our two Hungarians uh, that we, there's three of us, weren't did the summit, and yeah, uh, uh, if some, I don't know why, what was going through his head, but when he went to take the picture with my phone or whatever, uh, so I had the, his mate with his proper DLSR taking the picture from the rear that you see, mm. and then there's another picture where he's in frame and he stood for some weird reason in the front of me, getting full <laughs> front of me, with his like just like a shocked face not wanting to see what he's seeing and it's just hilarious i've got a lot of time for that picture because it's just funny <laughs> so when you're not doing challenges or any other crazy shit what are your hobbies uh just traveling and just uh, i just I, I, I like pushing myself to become a better me basically and in, in the process and hopefully inspiring other people to then do the same to better themselves to be a better them than yesterday and uh, to push themselves physically mentally to always uh, push that red line uh, to see what they're capable of. Uh, and that's what I, I hope uh, I get. And I, I get through DMs and stuff on the page uh, on a regular basis. Um, and, and that is my hobby. And that's what I do outside. If I'm not doing a challenge, I'm tra- training up or thinking of the next challenge. Um, my life doesn't fully revolve around it. Obviously, I have a partner and I have a job and stuff like that. But And I can't wait to go traveling again. But yeah, really, uh, I'm hoping to start a YouTube channel. I, I'm building a platform and my next thing is uh, starting an official website. So it's just trying to increase that platform to increase the reach to increase more people to inspire. Mm. What is it you do for work at the moment? Yeah, because COVID, uh, my my previous job of security is out the window. Yeah, uh, I was at security in a hospital, but to be honest, a hospital's more like the, it's the hornet's nest of uh, the the peak of COVID. You couldn't get any more of a hostile area and a hospital for for where it can be. So yeah, I had to get back foot out of that unfortunately. But then I raised money for them in in return, and that fifteen thousand four hundred or something. Uh, so I was happy with that. Um, and then, yeah, I kind of was uh, a bit lost. And then uh, uh, I had a friend and he he, he gets his windows clean. I'm uh, now window clean and doing anywhere between 23 to 28,000 steps a day. It's ridiculous. Uh, so that, yeah, it keeps me busy. And they're like my non-training days. And like, and then when I'm supposed to be resting and I'm training up for a challenge. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite funny. So what's been, well, what would you say has been the biggest struggle in your life thus far and how did you overcome it? Uh, I don't know, like, yeah, we've touched a couple of things, like obviously that extended uh, to 10 weeks in the military because my mindset wasn't in the right place or uh, we touched also you can pick your friends, you can't pick your family, so uh, all the negatives and everything, the attachments that come with the, your family, they, they, I think, I don't think anyone lives what 
a perfect life. Yeah. And, uh, and it's what sculpts and makes us hopefully better, uh, how we cope, our coping mechanisms and how we deal with that. Uh, so I think you I think everyone's got to have a hardship to then really appreciate and, uh, and, and enjoy the positives in life and mm. also to have uh, a coping ne- mechanism as uh, resilience. Uh, and uh, as long as hopefully in an ideal world, that's in bite sized chunks. Like, you, you, I feel really unfortunate for people that I live a very cotton wool life and then something could, like tragic happens, like maybe yeah. the parents or partner unfortunately dies or they, they, they get, uh, they're unemployed and they can't now find work or they've lo- lost a limb or something. Uh, so they've lived, they've not really had that resilience built up, not had any high hardships in their life. And then they go from flash to bang. And it's like, how does a person like that with no, no barrier around them cope with that? that? I feel sorry for people like that because that, that does happen. Yeah. Uh, you do have to go for your negatives. You do have to know how to uh, how to cope for being dumped or losing your job or or being even physical uh, physical pain and stuff, uh, mental pain to then hopefully be a, to grow on. Yeah, exactly. So on that, what is your why? Like, what's your purpose for life? I, I didn't think I had a really a reason, or I was a bit lost. I didn't wasn't on a track or a course, but now I reckon like I said, with what I'm doing now, uh, to just hopefully for people to take something off and whether it means like someone sees me doing my challenge and goes, I, I want to get, I want to push myself now, or whether that means I want to take the uh, stairs instead of escalator or yeah. I want to find that very far parking space and walk into the shop rather than try and squeeze in between two cars or, uh, or just walk to the shops. Uh, uh, or they want to do the first 5k or, or 10k or half marathon or whatever, or, or just giving them like a creativity inspiration where they go, why do I have to be a sheep? Why don't I think of something, something different? Put me under the spotlight. I spoke to you earlier before, where do all these ideas come in? I think, uh, yeah, I was an artist, uh, or training up to be, so I have a creative mind anyway, but I think you need to really be in this modern day, uh, with everyone doing Ironmans and ultras and doing things that kind of you then become a sheep in that sense, like even though it's an absolute feat, like people even down to marathons, half marathons, and five Ks is is massive, like especially for that individual. But um, you can get very lost in it. That uh, I think to really stand out in this day and age, just get under the spotlight, you have to think as well. You have to be creative. Um, like people like Ross Edgley, swimmer, I've been the first person to swim around the whole of Great Britain. Um, to people crossing the uh, solo uh, across the Antarctic, uh, just uh, there's uh, the guy that did uh, the seven summits quicker, so Grand Slam. These these people uh, are phenomenal, and 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 they stand out because they are uh, one of a few, yeah. and uh, and I think. It's, it's them that gives them a spotlight that then hopefully inspires other people to ne- maybe not do something as creative or outlandish, but just one step in the right direction. Yeah, jump out of their comfort zone and do something yeah. new. Yeah, so my, 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 my why is just to inspire people. I'm yeah. hoping that's the reason, hoping that uh, from the experience and examples and messages and people speaking to me, it seems to be doing that. It, I seem to hopefully be inspiring people not to do Mont Blanc, but uh, <laughs> in the manner I did, you can't do it now. It's illegal, but, um, but everything else. Yes. Yeah. Well, just saying like you've inspired me to push and do more stuff. So thank you. And I've loved talking to you so far. No, no, thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. Mm. Who, who inspires you or who do you look up to? There's a, it's so many different people. There's a guy called, uh, a guy only just recently come across and that's through a friend uh, that's a former Marine that I didn't know he'd been following my page and eventually I advertised I wanted to do some peaks uh, for my big daddy challenge next year. So these milestones and uh, so I want to do some barefoot running around some 
mountains and uh anyway met him and he was like oh there's a former marine that's doing all the monroes at the moment uh and he's on track to smash the record that's been standing for over a decade now called kobe uh kobe campbell i think he is and he literally just smashed it uh in 31 days and 23 hours from what was previously standing at 38 days um basically it's 282 mountains in Mount, uh, in scotland that uh, over 3000 feet uh, basically wow. this guy called sir william munro uh, that went and marked them all off uh, listed them and checked them off and ever since then uh, i think your average time there's 6700 people roughly that have done them uh, called munro bagging is uh, you bag them off and um average time is 8 years to do them and there's only about 50 people have done it in one go and there was a guy called Charlie Campbell, postman, that did it in 48 days. Basically worked out he was doing marathon and going up Ben Nevis, the biggest mountain in the UK, uh, twice every day. So marathon and that going twice for 48 days. And then he held that in 2000. Then Spike did it in 38 days, took 10 days off. And then this uh, Donny Cam- uh, Tony uh, Campbell, or whatever his, uh, his first name is, he just absolutely kicked it out of the park. Uh, and just took a whole week off it, and nobody think he'd be able to be able to do that. And it's these people that uh, just keep pushing. And like even before my time, the people that uh, broke the did the four minute mile, and the people that that won fifty nine marathon. Mm. Just these people are inspiration. Um, yeah, people that just do things that you can't imagine are possible, or just because no one's done it before, and then they go out and do it. Yeah, it's it's crazy what the body can do especially with the mind, how f- that, that would take a lot of mental toughness to do all that stuff. Yeah, it's definitely in the mind. Well, the Marines have a uh, motto. We have two mottos. Um, so one motto is 99.9% need not apply because yep. the, the passing rate is so low. So low. Uh, but the other one is the state of mind. It's your mind that will get you through. No matter how fit you are, even uh, with what I did training for six months and getting in there with, the, unfortunately, in the negative, the wrong mindset, uh still there's still gonna be points where i hit walls or people in the same position are hit walls and it's your mind that gets you through and goes i'm not going to quit i'm going to keep on pushing yeah. um mind uh, there's a there's navy seals uh saying uh which obviously um oh, why am i david goggins uh he 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 basically aired it is uh but it's the seals quote is uh when you think you're done you're only 40 percent done yeah it's your mind. It's so, so powerful. You just exactly. got to into it. It's just like my marathon. So we did a uh, 1.4 kilometer loop and our cars were right there. So I could have quit at any time and hopped in my car. But I was like, yeah, no, nah, yeah. I'm not quitting. I'm getting this done. Even though I couldn't feel my legs, you just got to push through that. And it's all mental toughness. Yeah. And I think that the easiest way to do that or the most cheap or the best way to continue is just go just one more step. Just mm. one more break it down even if you have to break it down to that small yeah like, even if it's right at the beginning even if you've got 26 42 kilometers whatever to do marathon and you've just broken up the first 100 meters you go just come on do 100 to 105 meters and then get to that five go right that lamppost over there get to that lamppost right that yeah. now got to that lamppost to get to that end of the street and just keep breaking it down and, and ne- the next thing you know you've done it hmm. where do you see yourself in the next few years do you have big goals I think if you haven't got your goals, uh, then I know, I know some people, that, I know there's a lot of people that don't have goals. And have, it's a shame that people don't know where to be pointing or a bit lost. And I think uh, having a goal is a great thing, a great position and, and a blessing really to have something to be focused on. And yes, I uh, at the moment, many, many goals I have. I have some of my challenges. I have a challenge at the moment. I'm looking at doing the end of November. I'm not not announced it fully yet. Uh, but I've now become an ambassador of a, a company called Powerhouse Fitness. Uh, I think they've got 72 stores in nine countries, the biggest one in Europe uh, for home and fitness. They've uh, supported me on this, and I'm going to raise money for a, another charity uh, just prior to Christmas, uh, hopefully down in London or Mar- uh, Manchester. Um, that is actually going to then be linking to my next challenge. Um, I'll do another challenge in February, which will take my whole month. So the f- uh, one coming up uh, is going to be shorter now. I'm not going to close how much that is, but the one in February is going to be a whole month. 
And then I've got a big daddy one, the biggest one of my 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 CV, should we say? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, in the whole of summer of UK, um, and then hopefully, I think I might announce on here. I can't remember if I did. Uh, doing that hundred sprints is hopefully means I'm going to try and to up the level. Even though yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to quit so much, like eighty three or eighty seven, just like you, mm. uh, like, I could have got my car. But yeah, I was just like, when's this going to be over? And I just kept doing, just ticking them off. Just do one more lap, do one more lap, just do one more sprint. Uh, but yeah, I want to try and take that hundred sprint up to two hundred and fifty three. I think it works out roughly, and do the same pace as the guy that holds one fifty nine. But in real terms, it'll take me four hours to do. A 159 uh, yeah. um and that's my last challenge in the uk so we're now looking this time next year before i then uh christmas time to part off to new zealand start a new life and continue to hopefully do what i'm doing have an income at this point from what i'm doing uh, through the, the likes of youtube or uh getting sponsored by people or uh, supported and just keep hopefully building that platform to inspire people that is my goal is them challenges to then keep growing to then hopefully have an income coming from it and then continue to hopefully have a positive impact on people. Yep. In New Zealand. Mm. What's one piece of, I guess, life advice you could give to listeners, especially in these tough times? Don't quit. It sounds so simple. It's, uh, and at the end of the day, we all go, life is a roller coaster. There's ups and there's downs. It's that simple. Uh, and like I said uh, before, you have to have your negatives, you have to have your downs, you have to have your hardships. Uh, and because uh, you build up resilience, you build character, it makes you a better person, but also it makes you appreciate your positives, makes you enjoy them ups. And at the end of the day, no matter how hard or how long that going down is going and how distant the memories of the, the highs were, there will be a turning point and when you eventually go around the turning point you'll appreciate the high so much mm. so it's going to happen no matter if you have three negatives or back to back and they're catastrophically big uh, someone's passed away you've lost your job or you lost a limb and then something else happens tragic and then something else happens it's eventually going to not happen there's eventually going to be something it could be even something super small like I don't know like you've had a full a full night's sleep it's super minor, but grab hold of it, both hands, don't let go. Grab hold of that silver lining. So don't quit. No matter how bad something is, it's going to be good eventually. Yeah, exactly. And so many people quit right before the good thing happens too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think also like something could be negative, but life is built of neg- uh, positives and negatives. Everything positive has a negative to it and everything negative has a positive to it. So even if you're in a bad place, Find a silver lining to that negative thing and just grab hold of it in both hands, like I said just a minute ago. Yeah. Uh, make that small thing massive. Hmm. So when you're all done and dusted, your time's up on this earth, what would you like to be remembered for? Uh, hopefully inspiring other people to better themselves. Yep. Hopefully I've impacted as many people as I possibly can. Um, I'm a pebble in a big sea at the moment and uh, hopefully, po- uh, fingers crossed, uh, I'll become uh, maybe, uh, maybe a, a decent-sized pebble by the end of it. <laughs> and hopefully I've, I've caused enough ripples to touch enough lives to uh, be left um, in a, for that reason. Mm. And last question, what's your definition of success? Definition of success is um, it's not... It's not possessions and it's not riches. It's not like the amount of figures you've got in your bank account or how high you've climbed in a company. Mm. It's just like your success, your happiness, your contentment. Like, and not just for yourself, but the people around you. Like, do you add value to someone's life? Uh, do they add value to your life? Um, but uh, are you happy? Can you stop for one minute and go, you know, I'm happy where I am right now. If I never climbed any further, if I never got any more successful, if I got no more richer, like is my health and the people around me or where I am at the moment, even if you're on your own, am I happy? And if you are, fantastic. And if you're not, put yourself in that situation. Are you happy? Yeah, 100%. I 100%. I think you've got to have that positive mind frame. Mm. Like I can sit here now and think of some negatives. 
I can sit here and dwell on something that hasn't quite gone. Like I, st- I still haven't done that YouTube channel. We're now what month in the year? <laughs> uh, or that big delay on the Mont Blanc or whatever. Like if I rewind the hands of time and be back in that situation, but you still got that mental uh, frame of going, no, I'm not looking at the negatives. I'm not having that negative guy on my shoulder. I'm going to listen to this guy. I'm going to be in that better frame of mind. So yeah, I am happy. Yeah, sweet. Well, I guess we'll probably wrap up this episode here. It's been awesome chatting to you and I look forward to all the challenges. I know you've got a few sponsors. Do you want to give them a shout out? Uh, well, at the moment, obviously, Powerhouse Fitness is obviously supporting me on my next challenge that I've not announced yet, um, but I soon will be doing. Um, but yeah, hop on over to Disney RM, either on Instagram, Facebook. Uh, I barely use Twitter. Twitter's a weird one. Uh, hopefully on YouTube in the uh, near future. But yeah, Instagram, Facebook's where I am. And if you uh, if you follow me on that, you'll hopefully find out soon what my next challenge at the end of November will be and the big Sweet. daddy next summer. <laughs> Sweet. Well, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate your time. It's been an awesome chat. And yeah, I can't wait to see what the future holds for you. Fantastic. I'm going to send you over that, uh, that link of that live of me eating chilies and cinnamon challenge. Yeah, for sure. I'd love to watch that. <laughs> Cheers, man. All right, thanks for having me. All good.